Uno. Aló. Dos. Uno. Aló. ¿Me escuchan? ¿Me oyen? Nada. Uno. Ah, Jets. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to the joint se session, Gigos and Circas. Okay, thanks. Uh, most of us are familiarized with CIRGAS. CIRGAS is the geocentric reference system for the Americas. It was initiated about 1993. So CIRGAS is celebrating uh, 26 years of uh, hard activities. <laughs> um, CIRGAS is more or less the largest geodesic forum in Latin America and it's very known uh, from the geodetic community and also for the technician community. GIGOS, GIGOS is the global geodetic observing system of the International Association of Geodesy. Uh, GIGOS was initiated in 1998 um, as the main interface of the International Associa Association of Geodesy with the scientific and practical users of geodesy. So GIGOS provides like a connection and interface between the high-level products generated by IAG and the needs uh, of the society and other geosciences um, uh, based on, on your special data. Uh, GIGOS was uh, introduced as a project of the IDG in 2003 and it was uh, declared as a former uh, component of IDG in 2007 and since the, that time GIGOS is growing uh, we have now more components. Uh, we, have, uh, we have two, bodu, the two bureaus for networks and observations, other one from products and standards. We have uh, now four focus topics um, and so on. So we, we, we can see uh, in the presentations today uh, the different structure of the International Association of Geodesy and uh, the Global Geodetic Observing Systems and all its components. Um, GIGOS usually meets um, to, to discuss present challenges, achievements, and um, what have we to face to continue bringing forward GIGOS. Uh, the GIGOS days uh, were introduced in 2015, the first time was uh, in Frankfurt, and the GIGOS days are three or four days where only GIGOS topics discuss, are discussed in these in this four, this four days. The idea to have the GIGOS uh, days uh, in South America was born in uh, GIGOS Day 2016 in Boston. Someone asked Luis Paulo if uh, he can host the, the GIGOS days in Rio, and I mean it was um, Mike, Mike. Mike asked if uh, we can get the GIGOS days in South America. Uh, and uh, so we are here thanks to the invitation of Luis Paulo and of course thanks to the invitation of Sonia. Uh, this is the first time that the GIGOS days is sharing a whole day with uh, another meeting, in this case CIRGAS. Uh, and I hope this is uh, the, the first experiment of uh, more common joint sessions with, with other scientific communities. Um, okay, I think this is everything what we have to say as introduction. Someone wants to add something? It's okay, so we can start with the presentations. Uh, the, the first presentation um, is about the International Association of Geodesy. It will be given by Harald Chu. Harald is a director of the Department of Geodesy at the German Research Institute. 
German Research Center for Geosciences in Potsdam, and he's also professor of uh, satellite geodesy at the University of Technology in Berlin, and he is the immediate past president of IEG. Good morning, everybody, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Laura, for the introduction. My name is Harald Schuh. I'm from the GFZ, the German Research Center for Geosciences, and I'm currently the immediate past president of IAG. In fact, the term finished just uh, about three months ago at the General Assembly of IAG and IUGG in Montreal, and uh, during uh, my term, Hermann Dreves was the past, uh, the Secretary General, now he is the immediate past Secretary General. <laughs> and uh, so we together, we developed uh, this presentation about IAG and its global geodetic observing system. Let's start from top, uh, the organizational uh, situation on, on the highest level <laughs> We have the International Science Council, ISC, which is already on a political level. And uh, it was constructed with the merger of the former ICSU, maybe some of you still remember ICSU, and the ISSC, which is dealing with the social sciences. And uh, within the ISC, we have uh, more than 40 international unions like the International Astronomical Union, or also International Cartographic Association is on this level. And here is IUGG, the International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics. Now let's go one level down. Under IUGG, we have eight associations. One of the eight associations is IAG, International Association of Geodesy. We also have Association of Cryospheric Sciences, of Geomagnetism, of Hydrology, um, oceanography, atmospheric sciences, seismology, and uh, volcanology. Now, what do we have within the IAG? We have um, member countries, more than 70 member countries, and the council, in the council, there are the representatives of the member countries. Uh, for instance, Professor Denizar was the um, representative from Brazil. We have an executive committee which is elected by the council, <coughs> the bureau, and the office, which is under the secretary general. And um, the new structure for the new term, which just started recently, can be seen here. The president is Suhia Altamimi, vice president is Richard Gross, secretary general now is Marco Potanen from Finland, and we have four commissions. Commission one on reference frames, that's to which SIRGAS belongs to as um, part of a subcommission chaired by Christoph uh, Kotsakis. Then Commission 2 on Gravity Field, dealing with geoid, etc. Chaired by uh, Adrian Jägi from Switzerland. Geodynamics and Earth Rotation. The president is Janusz Bogus from Poland. And Applications, the president here is Alison Keeley from Australia. And, as was already mentioned yesterday by Hermann, we have an inter-commission committee on theory chaired by Pavel Novak. What is also very important, that's the workhorse of IAG, are the services. We have services dealing with geometric techniques, dealing with gravimetry and uh, physical geodesy, and some uh, general tasks. Later I have a list of the services. And, um, these services are also represented in the executive committee. <coughs> and then, and very important, is the Global Geodetic Observing System with a kind of umbrella organization of all the, uh, the service activities, chaired by, so far by Richard Gross. Just recently, the new chair was elected. That's um, 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 Bizarra Miyahara from Japan, and um, he will get connected by um, video conference tomorrow, I guess. And we have a communication outreach branch, 
And we have members at large. One of the members at large is Sonia Costa from Brazil. Well, this slide shows the mission of the IAG, which is, of course, to advance geodesy. <laughs> That's our main goal. Uh, by furthering geodetic theory. Geodetic theory is very important through research and teaching. Collecting, analyzing, modeling, interpreting in observational data, stimulating technological development, and providing a consistent representation of the figure, rotation, and gravity field of the Earth and the planets. That's the classical definition by Helmut, as you know, and still is our main goal. Figure, rotation, gravity field of the Earth. And, of course, also the temporal variations. Uh, these objectives are summarized here to achieve the mission by studying all geodetic problems related to Earth observation and global change. For instance, to define, establish, and maintain global and regional reference systems. To work on the gravity field, rotation and dynamics of the Earth and the planets, positioning deformation, important, in particular important for ocean, um, uh, ice, and sea level rise studies. And we're also interested in uh, geodetic contribution to study the atmosphere and the hydrosphere. Now let's briefly go through the commissions. And under the commissions, there are sub-commissions. I don't want to go into all uh, uh, details here. Just to show you, to give you a brief uh, overview, sub-commission 1.1 is dealing with coordination of space techniques. Subcommission 1.2 with global reference frames. The, um, by the way, the IRS conventions, the next update will come up uh, soon. Then regional reference frames, that's where Silgas is located. We have other regional reference frames like UREF in Europe, uh, AFREF in Africa, APREF in the Asian Pacific region, Antarctica and also to the time-dependent transformations between reference frames. And Subcommission 1.4, dealing with the interaction between the celestial and the terrestrial reference frames. Here, uh, the main goal is a consistent realization of the ITRF and the ICRF, and in between, <coughs> we have the EOPs. There are working groups, and um, Commission 2, dealing with gravity field activities, <coughs> Subcommission 2.1, gravimetry and gravity network, in particular dealing with absolute and superconducting gravity measurements. 2.2, methodology for geoid and physical height systems, also very important in many countries, we still need a precise geoid for the height measurement. Satellite gravity mission, like the GRACE follow-on mission, which was launched last year in May. Regional geoid determination, so this is also dealing with the regional and national uh, geoids. And 2.5, satellite altimetry, a new international altimetry service is under construction. And finally, 2.6, gravity and mass transport in the Earth system. Uh, this uh, subcommission is dealing with results obtained from the satellite gravity missions. For instance, investigating variation of groundwater, melting of ice, etc. Now, Commission 3, Earth Rotation and Geodynamics. Here, Subcommission 3.1, Earth Tides and Geodynamics. Crustal deformation, which is now has been transformed to a new uh, subcommission called Volcano Geodesy, jointly with the Association of Volcanology. 3.3, Earth rotation geophysical fluids, effect of geophysical fluids on the rotation of the Earth and polar motion, cryospheric deformation, tectonics and earthquakes, geodesy. That's now going to be a subcommission together with IASPE with the Association of Seismology. What are the challenges of geodesy to rotation geodynamics? And I just one um, in red is what is new, what has been new during the last term. And here we have several new inter-association sub-commissions or inter-commission committees or IAG project. For instance, with the IASPE, as already mentioned, we have the Seismo Geodesy. With IAFTE, we have an inter-association sub-commission on Volcano Geodesy. 
and with the cryospheric sciences, we have an inter-association uh, subcommission on cryosphere geodesy. We also decided to establish a new inter-commission committee on marine geodesy, very important. As you know, 70% of the surface of the globe is covered by oceans. So marine geodesy, ocean bottom, uh, surveying of the ocean bottom, etc., is still a very important goal. Uh, Intercommission Committee on Geo Geodesy for Climate Research, which was also established. Chair is Annette Eicher. A lot of what we are doing, a lot of activities are directed to climate research, can be used for climate research, like sea level rise, um, um, a significant trend in tropospheric parameters, and a lot of other effects. And uh, that's also very important. We have a new project, IG project on novel sensors, in particular using quantum technology in geodesy. The chair is Jürgen Müller from Hannover. Finally, Commission 4 on positioning and application. Here, 4.1, emerging positioning technologies, GMSS augmentation, also a very important issue in many countries. Geospatial mapping, geodetic engineering, Atmosphere remote sensing, a very strong subcommission dealing with investigation of troposphere and ionosphere and several effects, ionosphere, atmosphere coupling, multidimensional ionosphere models, ionosphere scintillations, etc. And finally, multi-GNSS, which is also a big uh, issue, important uh, issue today. Now, very briefly, the Intercommission Committee on Theory, which is dealing with theoretical work. And here we have, in total, 13 joint study groups with the commissions. I don't want to go through all of them, just to, let's say, let's see a few examples. For instance, um, the multi-GNSS theory and algorithms, very important task. Nowadays, we have all the different uh, global navigation satellite systems, and there are, as you know, these inter-satellite biases and inter-frequency biases, and it's really confusing <laughs> and getting very difficult. We have uh, another one on space weather and ionosphere, and um, also, for instance, geophysical modeling of time variations in deformation and gravity field observations. That's a list of the services, and as I already said, the services, that's where the real work is being carried out. And all of you know, for instance, the International GNSS Service, um, also the International VLBI Service, International Laser Ranging Service, which are, let's say, contributing to the work done within the International Earth Rotation Reference System Service. So these are dealing with geometric techniques. Then we have the services dealing with gravimetry, as, for instance, the... Um, the um, IGETS, which was just recently established, International Geodynamics and Earth Tides Service, collecting all the superconducting gravimetry data, and also um, uh, the um, ICGEM, International Center for Global Earth Models, collecting all the global Earth models that exist and provide them to the users. And we have the permanent service for mean sea level, uh, the International Altimetry Service is under construction. We really believe that we need such a service, which does not exist so far. And um, there is also the Bureau International des Bois, Bois et Mesures, which was mentioned yesterday by Hermann. Yeah, what else is new? Let's focus again what is uh, printed in red characters. Now, within the IGFS, the International Gravity Field Service, there is now a new product center on combination of the time variable gravity field solutions with the acronym COST-G. So now for the first time, the various gravity field solutions which are obtained, for instance, from GRACE and um, um, uh, GRACE follow-on, uh, are now combined to a common product, to a common result. And that's really important because in the past, many users, they always contacted us which one of the 10 different solutions shall we take? And uh, because a normal hydrologist, he does not know which is the best or which, he, which would be the most precise for his application. And um, so now we have a combined product similar to IRS, where we also have a combined 
the reference frame and combined earth orientation parameters. Yeah, and uh, as I uh, already mentioned, this is also new International Geodynamics and Earth Tide Service. And there was a renaming of the International Service for the Geoid from IGS to ISG. IGES to ISG. <laughs> okay. This list we have already seen under the or contributing to the IRS, we have these four uh, geometric services. And now let me come, what are the new challenges in geosciences? And that's really important. What, what are our goals? And one of our main goals is to uh, contribute to investigating natural disasters like typhoons, flooding. There is more. Uh, there are more storms, like yesterday <laughs> in Rio, <laughs> and flooding, so no doubt. And um, of course, there are also um, uh, e events that we cannot prevent, like uh, that we cannot avoid, like earthquakes or volcano uh, eruptions. But no doubt, there is a strong demand for prediction warning. And we have also a climate change, no doubt. These are the temperature series on the various continents up to 2005, and believe me, in the last 10 years, this was from the IPCC report, the, the um, uh, last one, and believe me, the last years, it increased even more, temperatures. In Europe, in the last three years, we had the hottest uh, recorded temperatures for, since ever, in the last 150 years. And in all continents, we have an increase of the, um, of the temperatures, we have a climate change, no doubt. And the GIGOS vision is to advance our understanding of the dynamic Earth system by quantifying our planet's changes in space and time. So that's the vision of GIGOS. And under IAG, or in the IAG bylaws, you can read the Global Geodetic Observing System works with the IAG components to provide the geodetic infrastructure that is necessary for monitoring the Earth system and global change research. So here, the quantification, that's the keyword. We provide the hard facts, a precise monitoring. That's where, what we, what we, where we are really strong. Provide very precise measurement and give the um, uncertainties of our results, of our products. Approaches of DIGOS, combination, integration of all available observations, in particular to combine physical measurements and the geometric techniques to improve our understanding of the interactions in system Earth. And here we summarize the GIGOS general goals to achieve the one millimeter position, open one millimeter per year velocity accuracy on global scales for the ITRF, to provide continuous measurements, for instance, of the time series of Earth orientation parameters in near real time with highest reliability and redundancy for the lowest possible cost for construction operation of the geodetic infrastructure. And uh, now, before I come to the end, let me just give you a few examples how we contribute to these so-called societal benefit areas. GEO, under GEO, there were in total nine societal benefit areas defined a few years ago, and we contribute at least to four of them. We contribute, for instance, to disaster research. And i give you one example for this. This shows the um, situation right after the strong earthquake uh, on March 11, 2011, near the coast of Japan, the so-called Tohoku earthquake, which caused a horizontal displacement of almost four meter. By the way, the um, ocean bottom, the epicenter was on the ocean bottom, was moved by up to 25 meters. And vertically on the coast, it was a motion of almost one meter. Let me see. Ah, now we have a, we show the deformation field in the first minutes after the main shock. Here you can see the time. And when you look carefully, you see very nicely how this deformation field is um, moving along the um, island. And now we are 20 minutes after the main shock. And this could be measured so precisely 
because the Japanese colleagues, they have a very dense network of uh, more than 1,200 GPS stations all over the country in a um, distance of a maximum 10 to 20 kilometers. Second example, contribution to weather research. That's from our work from GFZ. We provide for 400 GNSS stations, mainly over in Germany, but also from Europe. We provide um, uh, tropospheric zenith delay to the weather service, to the German weather service that is used for weather prediction. And here you can also see an example that uh, the um, um, uh, providing the atmospheric slant data to the DWD, which is the German weather forecast, improved precipitation forecast in this example by 20%. And that's really a lot because precipitation is a very important um, information for farmers, for instance, and also for tourists, by the way. <laughs> uh, climate research. Climate research. Uh, that means long term, 20 years or longer. And here, again, GNSS provides very important results. For instance, that's a trend which has been observed in um, uh, Greenbelt with a GNSS station since 1994 for more than 20 years. And you can see here there is a clear increase of humidity above the station. Finally, global hydrology. And now we come to Grace Follon, the two satellites orbiting around the Earth in a distance of 220 kilometers. And I guess most of you know the basic principle of Grace and Grace Follon. So I don't have to explain it here. The distance is measured and the distance is slightly variable and from the variation of the distance you can monitor, you can get information about changes of the masses below. Changes of ice for instance, changes of groundwater. And here we have uh, some results, groundwater depletion in South America, in India, northern India, very dramatic, in Australia, southwest of the United States, Iran, also very clear decrease of the groundwater. Now the farmers have to go down 100 meters to get down to uh, groundwater and in China. And uh, Grace Follon was launched last year. I always like to, to watch it. Just three seconds <laughs> until the, it was last year in May at Fundberg Air Force Base in California and we could watch it just from the control uh, room. It was really impressive when the two satellites were launched and we could observe it very nicely uh, also in the following minutes. <laughs> Finally, outlook and future perspectives. We always should think about innovation and what are the technological developments that are relevant to geodesy. And one example is using quantum technology such as optical clocks for geodesy and geophysics. For instance, for height measurements. Maybe some of you know, have heard something about relativity and relativistic theory. There is um, the um, reading of a frequency, of a clock, of the frequency provided by a clock is directly proportional to the potential. And the potential is corresponding to the height. So we can very nicely determine the height difference. If we have two clocks, two clocks, for instance here at the bottom of the mountain and here in a tunnel in the mountain, this was a first demonstration in, in Italy a few uh, months ago or two years ago, and it was published in Nature Physics. This allowed just from reading the two clocks to determine the height difference between these two uh, clocks, transportable clocks. The agreement was 19 centimeters, not perfect, but not so bad. And this caused a lot of um, um, attraction in the media, an optical clock to go. <laughs> and uh, so it was really, we got a lot of attention. So <coughs> Finally, let me summarize what we are doing in geodesy. In geodesy, we are doing observing, observation monitoring, ground-based airborne satellites. We process the data. We get the monitoring products, integrate, assimilate the data and the results, separate the various effects, and interpret the effects. 
This allows uh, to do a prediction, and from the prediction, we can improve the observation technologies, and from the improved observation, we get a better understanding and prediction of the Earth system. So quantification here is a very important issue, as I already mentioned. Satellites are used for many of our applications. Big data is another, um, uh, another challenge, because now the amount of data is increasing tremendously. Concepts, methodology, algorithms, that's where we are strong. We have to develop new concepts, new methodologies. Everything what you are doing is related to geospatial information. This brings us to the UNGGIM field, which is dealing with geospatial information. And of course, we are mainly interested in global phenomena, also in regional phenomena, but global phenomena like climate uh, uh, change is a big uh, task. And finally, before I finish, let me just mention that the next IUGG General Assembly will be in Berlin in July 2023. And everybody of you should consider, should make a long-term plan, and please come to Berlin in three, and a, three years and nine months to attend the General Assembly in the City Cube and um, so hope to see you in Berlin. That's the exact date. You can already make a note, July 12 to 19. And uh, this brings me to the end of the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harald. I think it was a very nice presentation with all topics uh, covered by Geodesy. Um, are there questions or comments? Uh, thank you, Harold. Uh, just a question about the infrastructure. Uh, have you been involved in the discussions about the uneven distribution of observatories and main fundamental stations around the world? Wh which is your opinion about this situation? It's true. We have an uneven distribution of the stations because many stations are located in Europe also quite a lot in North America, and now also in Asia, in China and Japan. Not so many we have on the Southern Hemisphere, and we definitely should get more and support all activities, getting more closing the gap on the Southern Hemisphere, and the UN GTIM activity is one of, of the ways to get there, to support countries. But I'm personally, I'm not in favor just going to a country, you need a, you need a host, you need a host who is feeling in charge, being in charge, f f feeling, f who feels being responsible for the instrument. Just going there and putting an instrument, I think that's not sustainable. But um, I think it's the main issue to close the gaps and to get a better distribution of the stations. Something else? If not, we can move to the next presentation. It will be about the GIGOS. And uh, the next speaker is Richard Gross. Sh Richard is uh, the chair of the IRS Combination Center at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory of NASA. Richard is the president, uh, present vice president of IAG and the immediately past president of GIGOS. Okay, uh, yes, thank you, Laura. Um, as she said, I am the immediate past president of GIGOS. My term ended on October 31st, Halloween, and the new president is, ba is Basara Miyahara of the Geospatial Information Authority of Japan. He sends his regrets for not being able to be here in person, but he will be joining us remotely, and I'll be giving this presentation on his behalf. And uh, this will be a very brief overview of GIGOS. Uh, 
the, um, of the, and its different components. The directors and leads of these different components will be speaking later today and will give more detail. And so in this brief overview, I will start with uh, my summary slide giving uh, my uh, a view of, of what GIGOS does for the uh, geodetic community. Um, I see it doing really uh, four different things. Uh, first, it's the requirement setting organization for geodesy. And so Harold had a slide on the requirements that have come out of, of GIGOS, um, mainly through its uh, book, the GIGOS 2020 book, and its updates that uh, we are planning. And um, I will describe uh, a new activity within the Bureau of Products and Standards on Essential Geodetic Variables, which is a methodology uh, for, um, uh, for setting requirements. Secondly, GIGOS is a forum for international collaboration. Um, and it's um, an advocate for the need to improve our uh, global geodetic infrastructure. And this is done by um, hosting uh, workshops, for example, uh, along with the International Earth Rotation and Reference System Service. We organize the Unified Analysis Workshops, which we just held um, um, in Paris um, a few weeks ago. Uh, so uh, third, like I say, we uh, GIGOS advocates the importance of geodesy to the broader uh, community. Um, not only you know to other geodesists, but to other geoscientists and to society at large. So we uh, represent the IAG uh, within the group on Earth observation. Uh, within the group on Earth observations, we're also an associate member of the committee on Earth observation satellites. And uh, both of those um, organizations have the goal of providing Earth observations uh, uh, that are needed by uh, decision makers to make informed decisions. And we are, as part of those uh, organizations, we are advocating for the importance of geodesy, geodetic observations. Um, and uh, we um, are also involved uh, through the IAG in the uh, UNGGIM subcommittee on geodesy, which is an emerging policy making um, organization that is going to have a very big impact, I think, on how we do business in geodesy. And finally, we are an incubator for new initiatives in geodesy. Uh, these are the focus areas, and uh, we currently have three of them. Unified height system that Laura leads and we'll talk about um, more. Uh, geohazards that John Lebrecht leads, and geodetic space weather research that Mikhail Schmidt leads. Uh, the fourth sea level change uh, variability and forecasting is probably going to get dissolved uh, since its work is basically done. So this is what I th um, see GIGOS doing for the global community. And the way it does it is um, through its, its components. This is the structure of, of GIGOS. Um, and what I will do is very briefly describe what each of these components uh, does. And I will start with the um, governing uh, bodies of, of GIGOS, uh, which is um, its consortium, coordinating board, and executive committee. So GIGOS is a part of the IAG. And so the consortium includes representatives of all of the components of the IAG. So it it's, um, uh, has up to two representatives of every IAG service, commission, intercommission committee. Um, it has a representative of um, the GIGOS affiliates, which I'll discuss um, uh, later. And uh, the president of the consortium is the president of GIGOS, and, the, and, and this is Basara Miyahara, and he is appointed by the IAG executive committee. Uh, and the consortium is basically the steering committee of GIGOS. It, 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 it is the electing body, and it elects the um, open positions on the coordinating board. So the coordinating board is the central oversight and decision-making body of GIGOS. Uh, this is um, like a, a governing or directing board of a service. Um, for GIGOS, it's called the coordinating board. And it is composed of 
of representatives of the different services and uh, commissions, as well as you know the president, and vice president of GIGOS, and you know everybody else listed there, um, as as well as representatives of the different components of GIGOS, the bureau directors and and um, committee and working group chairs, the focus area leads, and the president of the coordinating board is you know the same as the president of the consortium, which is the president of GIGOS. And then the executive committee is a much smaller body. Um, it, it consists of eight members and, and three guests. Um, and they are in charge of basically the day-to-day -day activities of GIGAS. And the members of the executive committee are listed here. Uh, and uh, so Basar's president and Laura will become the vice president as soon as she is confirmed uh, by the coordinating board, which we expect to happen in the next couple of weeks. Uh, uh, also, the members of the executive committee are the two bureau directors, Detlef Angerman and Mike Perlman, both of whom are here at the meeting. Uh, the director of the coordinating office, Martin Sainall, who is also here. Uh, Allison Craddock, the manager of external relations, who is here at the meeting. And uh, to be determined are uh, the uh, coordinating board are representatives of the coordinating board on the executive committee. Um, and then the permanent guests are the immediate past president, which is me, the chair of the science panel, which is um, Kasuki Heki from Japan, and the IAG president, Zuhair Altamini. Okay, so GIGOS affiliates. Um, so, so, so the uh, governing body of GIGOS is, is really uh, composed of representatives of the different IAG um, uh, components, but um, in or but there are many more geodetic uh, organizations interested in geodesy that are not necessarily part of the IAG, and so to um, open up GIGOS to allow these other organizations to be involved in GIGOS, we created uh, this position called the GIGOS affiliate, and this is. It's a national or regional organization um, that coordinates space geodetic activities in that nation or region. And like I say, these were established to increase participation in GIGOS, particularly from uh, underrepresented regions of the world, such as Africa, Asia, or Latin America. So this is a full component of GIGOS. They have representation on the consortium and coordinating board. And our first GIGOS affiliate is GIGOS Japan. Uh, the, um, this was established in 2013. The current chair of this is Toshi Otsubo, who is the, um, also the chair of the um, International Laser Ranging Service's governing board. And uh, the, um, uh, this was, uh, cr they, they created this um, um, at the time it was a working group in, Ch in Japan in order to provide a forum within Japan uh, 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 that for the different organizations that own the different uh, space geodetic infrastructure there to provide a forum for them to talk um, you know, uh, with each other and to um, improve the quality of observations and encourage collaboration within Japan. So that's the idea of an affiliate. Um, it's, it, if, if any um, organization uh, would like to uh, become more involved uh, within GIGOS, um, uh, just uh, apply to become an affiliate. It just takes a short letter to the president, and uh, we would certainly welcome uh, more um, organizations to be involved. And so this is, you know, a description of, of what they do. They have created this. Ah, okay, so they've created this leaflet here. Um, it's in Japanese, but it describes, um, you know, geodesy and GIGOS to the um, to the Japanese to try to um, advocate for the importance of, of geodesy to Japan. Um, and and uh, they were the hosts of our last GIGOS Days meeting um, last year um, in Tsukuba. And this is, you know, pictures from, from that meeting. Okay, the GIGOS Science Panel. So this, um, the role of the Science Panel is to be an independent advisory body to make sure that what GIGOS does uh, meets the requirements of the scientific community. And so it is composed of representatives of, 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 of the geodetic and geoscience communities. 
they are most active in um, organizing sessions at the major conferences. Um, and, they, and they also, you know, co-organize the unified analysis workshops with the IERS. Uh, this is the membership of the uh, science panel. Um, they come from, you know, the different commissions, which are the science arm of the IAG, as well as the focus areas uh, within, uh, um, uh, uh, within GIGOS. And like I say, the chair of the science panel is uh, Kosuke Heki. From, um, from Japan, I'm, I was the, before I became the immediate past president of GIGOS, I was the immediate past chair of the science panel. Um, and then this is just some of their um, activities. Like I say, they are most active in, in organizing sessions at conferences. Uh, okay, so now we come to the coordinating office. Um, so this is like a central bureau of a, um, of a service. And so it's meant to, it's, it's called the coordinating office because it's meant to coordinate the work within GIGOS, uh, support, you know, the chair and the executive committee and the coordinating board and to make sure that, that all of the components of GIGOS are active and, and are following the plans that they have written um, in their strategic implementation plans. Um, and, and so they maintain our website, and as I say, the director is Martin Sainall. And within uh, that um, coordinating office, well, so here are the activities briefly. Um, uh, the uh, coordinating office mo is hosted by BEV in Austria um, starting in 2016, and they've been developing the website. and and um, they hosted GIGOS Days in 2017 and, and basically just take care of the day-to-day -day business of GIGOS. Within the coordinating office resides this position of manager of external relations. Uh, this position was, was recently created in order to do a better job of managing GIGOS engagement with the external communities. The, group on Earth observations, the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, and the UNGGIM Subcommittee on Geodesy. Before this position was created, uh, our engagement with those communities was really on an ad hoc basis. Um, we just asked for volunteers to go to the, their different meetings. And, uh, but by creating this, this position, it, it allows us to have a more focused approach um, uh, within these different communities. And Allison is uh, that manager and will be talking more about this um, in her presentation. Um, and uh, so this is just um, a brief overview of what, um, of, of the GIGOS engagement within um, uh, those organizations, GEO and COS and UNGGIM. Okay. Um, also within the coordinating office is a new working group, uh, sorry, yes, a working group on digital object identifiers for geodetic data sets. This, this was recently created in order to um, uh, um, uh, generate uh, um, uh, uh, best practices um, uh, uh, um, recommendations on, on how DOIs uh, can be assigned to, uh, to our data. So we all know about DOIs and their use in publications. They're starting to be used for data. This, you know, gives um, uh, better traceability and accessibility and discoverability of our data sets. It, if you cite a data set in one of your journal articles, the reader can simply click on the DOI and and go to a website called the landing page from which that data can be downloaded. And so the working group uh, was uh, recently established. These are the members of the working group. Uh, they consist of representatives of the different data centers uh, within the IAG, as well as uh, representatives of, of, of people that are already doing this in the community. And uh, Kirsten Elger, is uh, GF said was uh, just recently elected to be the chair of that working group. Okay, uh, GIGOS Bureau of Products and Standards. This is led by Detlef Angerman. Um, so uh, in yellow, you know, 
uh, the EPS supports GIGOS um, uh, in its goal to obtain consistent prod uh, products uh, of the geodetic properties of the Earth. Uh, Detlef has a presentation on this later, so I will not say anything more ab about it. Um, and uh, this is, you know, a summary of, of, of the uh, accomplishments of his bureau during the last four years. Uh, within that bureau exists a committee on essential geodetic variables. Uh, so um, this uh, is is meant to uh, be a framework for guiding discussions within the geodetic community on what are essential about our products. You know, what do we think really uh, needs to be uh, um, regularly um, observed? And this follows uh, the, um, the lead of the Global Climate Observing System and the Global Ocean Observing System where they define their essential climate variables and their essential ocean variables. And the idea here is that it is a process uh, by which um, uh, you can derive uh, requirements, right? So, so you, you have a list of what you think are the essential variables. These might be, you know, the positions of reference objects like ground stations or radio sources, earth orientation parameters, you know, gravity measurements. And once you have the list of essential variables, you can assign requirements to them. Um, you can uh, derive requirements on products that depend upon those essential variables like reference frames. Um, you can also derive requirements on the um, instruments that observe those essential variables, um, the infrastructure we use. And so this is, like I say, it's a way of, of uh, assigning requirements. Um, it's kind of a bottom-up approach to assigning requirements, uh, which complements the top-down approach uh, taken in the GEOS 2020 book, where we looked at user needs. You know, what does a user say like, you know, uh, uh, somebody, uh, like an oceanographer interested in studying sea level uh, change. What does he need in terms of, um, you know, an accuracy of a reference frame? Um, so that's a top-down approach taken by, uh, uh, taken before by GIGOS, and this is a bottoms-up approach. And so this is a, a committee recently created within uh, the Bureau of Products and Standards. And these are the members of the committee, and I am its chair. Uh, it's a large committee, 37 people, representatives, again, of the services and commissions. So it's, you know, try to be all very inclusive in, um, uh, in, but in including different areas of, um, of the IAG. Okay, GIGOS Bureau of Networks and Observations. This is, uh, the director of this is Michael Perman, who is here and has a, presentation on this later, so I won't uh, say much of anything about this. Um, I'm just going to skip over all of this, uh, but I do, did want to uh, mention that one of his activities is to um, uh, send these certificates uh, out to the different uh, stations, uh, the, the different GIGA stations. So we saw yesterday that San Juan is a GIGA station and, and Algo. Um, in La Pata is also a GIGA station. Uh, okay, so now the focus areas. The unified height system, this is led by Laura Sanchez and she will be talking about this, so I'm not gonna say anything about it. Um, uh, and uh, we'll just go on. Uh, one of their um, activities is to um, um, establish uh, a, uh, the requirements for um, a network of, of, of reference height stations. And this is, you know, what they've selected um, in, uh, in April. Uh, geohazards, uh, this is chaired by John Lebrecht. Um, and what John is focusing on is of GNSS augmentation uh, uh, for tsunami early warning systems. So he has a working group. Um, of, oh, sorry. He has a working group that um, he has um, established uh, uh, in Latin America, uh, Mexico, um, 
um, is, is, is I think the only, uh, Mexico and Colombia are the two members of this working group. They held a workshop in 2017 and they're planning another workshop um, next year um, all in Sendai. The first workshop was in Sendai and so is, is next year's workshop. Uh, sea level change, variability, and forecasting, like I say, its work is done and so it will be uh, dissolved. And so geodetic space weather research is the newest uh, focus area. This is chaired by Mikhail Schmidt and uh, their focus is to improve models of the um, ionosphere and thermosphere in order to improve uh, spacecraft navigation in those regions. So this brings me back to my uh, summary slide. Uh, you can actually go through the different uh, uh, um, uh, or, uh, components of GIGAS and match them one for one for, for, um, uh, to these uh, um, contributions of GIGOS to the uh, global uh, geodetic community. And with that, I would like to thank you. Thanks, Richard. Are, are there questions? Comments? Recommendations? No? I think um, to say that some of our works in, in Latin America contributes to the global geodetic observing system of the IEG is um, a very strong argument to get some uh, support from our entities. So please consider the possibility to, to get more in touch with GIGOS and to see how can you take advantages of, of this a strong infrastructure offered by IEG and GIGOS. So if, okay, it works. I, I just want to say that um, I think the SILGAS community, including the work on physical geodesy, would be a perfect group being also a partner for GIGOS, as a C GIGOS a affiliate. This would be not to establish a new group <laughs> from South America or Latin America, but just based on the SILGAS community, of course, including ge people working on the geoid and gravimetry, would be uh, good also to contribute to GIGOS as one entity. Yes, yes I completely agree. I think uh, um, you might consider forming uh, something like um, uh, the GIGOS Latin America, right? That would be based upon the organizations that are participating in SIRGAS. Um, uh, so if, uh, so, so I would encourage uh, this community to consider uh, joining GIGOS as in that role, as an affiliate. Yeah, I'm checking that the new president and the new vice president are taking notes about that. <laughs> Okay, so we can move to the next presentation. It is, thanks again. We are ready, yeah? Thank you, I, I think, thank you. Okay, <laughs> so the next presentation will be given by Alison Craddock about GIGOS external relations. Alison works at the Jet Propulsion, El, um, La Jet Propulsion Laboratory of uh, NASA and uh, she, is, uh, she is the manager of the uh, external relations in Diego's. Okay. Bon dia. <laughs> and so um, I have a lot of slides with a lot of different things to cover, but I hope that uh, that this will you will be able to see that we're trying to identify tools and areas where our work overlaps with other people doing similar work and to try to make the most of, of this uh, identifying each other and working together. So as, uh, as Richard mentioned, the GIGOS external relations uh, lately has been concentrating on uh, our stakeholder relationships with United Nations entities, 
the group on Earth Observations, which is a, uh, an organization under the World Meteorological Organization, and the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites. And so I will concentrate on the, on the first two. So as we have noticed, there's lots of acronyms, and there's acronyms inside of acronyms. And so I'm, I'm going to try to explain the, from the UN perspective where we are. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> here we are. Um, so, a lot of people have mentioned the UN GGIM Subcommittee on Geodesy Global Geodetic Reference Frame, and I will review these acronyms in the next slide, but just to point out, um, so UN GGIM and all that stuff is over here, and that is connected to the Economic and Social Council of the UN. And we also, uh, through IGS and IAG, work with the International Committee on GNSS, which is based in the UN Office of Vienna under the Secretariat. <laughs> so it's, it's a lot to remember and to try to untangle, but we try to do that uh, on your behalf. And so uh, GGIM, the United Nations Initiative on Global Geospatial Information Management. As I said, it's under the Economic and Social Council. Uh, and then under this, it's on this group hosts the Subcommittee on Geodesy. And the Subcommittee on Geodesy is concentrating on establishing the Global Geodetic Reference Frame. And so, on the other side, there's the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, which has an international committee on GNSS. And within its working groups, there is working group D. It's a working group on reference frame applications and timing. And both the IGS and IAG are involved with that. And so how are we connecting uh, external relations with different projects? Well, we have... Uh, a contribution to via the geohazards focus area to the global assessment review report. We have been working with our group, our friends at the group on Earth observations, to help identify uh, the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction and sustainable development goals uh, elements. We've been working with collaborators to co-organize regional workshops. Uh, we have also been looking at how to find interoperable and modular elements in support of a new GGIM World Bank integrated geospatial information framework, which is a uh, kind of a template that will help people in uh, both developed and developing countries uh, make applications to the World Bank for funding of geospatial uh, infrastructure development and other elements. And uh, finally, that, that we, we partially through an external relations uh, initiatives, we were able to identify uh, the need for a working group on DOIs. And uh, thankfully, we found a very talented uh, chair, uh, Kirsten Elgar over at GFC, who is, uh, I'm sure you will meet sooner or later. She's uh, very enthusiastic, and I'm sure we'll be able to give some great clarity for how we can best give credit for uh, data production. So, why do we interface with the United Nations? Well, there's a lot of opportunities here for us to make sure that, uh, that we are connecting with the right people and that we're reaching out and always um, engaging with uh, more people. We want to make existing geodetic data discoverable and easily accessible. We want to work towards standardization and, of course, advocacy. And so we do this by our participation in United Nations entities and also through GEO, which also connects us in. So there's a lot of things that are kind of overlapping. And so one of the things that we are working with uh, with our colleagues at GEO is how to best identify geodetic contributions to the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. And specifically, there are uh, there are seven targets, goals, uh, for this framework, and we are concentrating on the last two. 
F and G. So F being to substantially enhance international cooperation with developing countries through adequate and sustainable support to complement their national actions for implementation of the present framework and to sub substantially increase the av availability of and access to multi-hazard early warning systems and disaster risk information. Now, uh, Harold mentioned that, that disasters are something that we're starting to look at more and more and that we find that when we look at the theme of disasters, there are a lot of, a lot of our stakeholder and uh, collaborative entities are also looking at that. So we're trying to find ways of making sure that we are contributing in the right places and that our work, our information, and our data is being made uh, available to those who can best use it. Now, through our focused area on geohazards, we have been able to make a successful contribution to a major uh, United Nations report addressing disaster risk reduction. And so this is the uh, global, assessment, global Assessment Report on Disaster Risk Reduction. And um, I will have a link to that uh, in the next slide. But the original paper you can download via this link down here. And so we're we are always looking to find a way to show that geodetic observations have a clear role in reducing the ri helping to reduce the risk of disasters and also for resilience. And we want to contribute to disaster preparedness with better mitigation and response. And so uh, Richard mentioned that there was a workshop in 2017 that the Geohazards Focus Area held. And these were their recommendations, and I'm not going to read all of them, but I will point out that there are a lot of recurring themes in these recommendations that we see in other parts of our work. So we need to make sure that we're coordinating our efforts. We're encouraging software data exchange, open, freely and openly available uh, data and, and skills. So it's not just the data, but also what do you do with it? What I have one piece of data, but what does this connect to? Or what are other essential pieces of data? We want to uh, try to advocate for strengthened broadband communications to underserved regions uh, in the world. Again, openly sharing GNSS receivers within uh, areas that are at risk for uh, geohazards. And uh, lastly, to make sure that we're interfacing properly with existing tsunami warning systems uh, and other existing disaster warning systems. Uh, we're trying to identify the best possible way for our work to contribute to gaps in other people's work or to find ways that our work can strengthen the, the, the hazards work that's already being done by other people, both in our community and uh, just outside of our community. And so the, I mentioned earlier this global assessment report on disaster risk reduction. And the reason why that this, is, this was a, uh, a big accomplishment for us is that this is a huge comprehensive report that the United Nations uh, produces once every two years. And they're trying to look at the global targets of both the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction and other elements that are contributing to this. And so. Uh, it was our opportunity to communicate how geodesy actually um, actually uh, fits into a much broader context. And so it's a very, very long report. I confess I have not read the entire thing. Uh, but there is a snapshot here that because of our contribution, there is a segment in this report which touches on all manner of things specifically talking about global navigation satellite systems. So it's a little bit, but it's a step in the right direction. And so you can go on the, uh, the UN Disaster Risk Reduction Prevention Web website, and you can actually find our paper. And so based upon this, and, and based upon making these steps, we say, well, how, how do we make sure we're, we're best supporting uh, geodesy in support of uh, disaster risk reduction. And so in the last year, we have successfully been able to propose a, what's called a community activity in the group on Earth observations. And uh, this is, it's kind of like a working group, but it's a place for us to gather together 
and uh, identify stakeholders in the, in the broader Earth observations uh, community and how geodesy can make sure that we are known to the broader Earth observations community and also try to identify the places where we can make the most impact with our contributions or even just to make sure that members of a broader community know that they can access our data and what our data may be useful for. And so uh, we look with the Group on Earth Observations to also help us uh, come up with strategies for capacity building for disaster risk reduction and resilience, to identify existing resources and stakeholder communities and make new connections. Again, talking about how we can make sure that we are uh, identifying with the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. And also uh, integration with the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the World Bank initiatives. And so we are planning to hold a, a joint workshop. It will be both the, the GIGOS a GINO, GNSS Enhanced Tsunami Early Warning System Working Group under the Geohazards Focus Area, as well as the GEO uh, Geodesy for Sendai Working Group a Community Activity. And this will be held uh, the first week of June next year in Sendai, Japan. And we would invite anyone who's interested in uh, possibly participating to please let us know. And within this workshop, from the perspective of our work with GEO, we are hoping to look and answer some of these questions. So what does the broader Earth observations need from uh, geodesy? How can we best address disaster risk and re reduction and resilience community needs? How can we better engage with our colleagues and other Earth observations techniques? Most importantly, ca how can we best identify what resources already exist? I think we all understand that budgets are uh, very tight. Sometimes the money is difficult to come by, but we all have one thing, whether it's large or small, that we may have available to share. And how do we make sure that we can make this known to some of our friends who may need it? And how can we make sure that it is organized in a way that can make sense in a broader scope? So maybe we all have some sort of a resource that could contribute to someone better understanding geodesy, but how do we gather this together and identify its applications? And then once we figure out what we already have, then we can start looking at, well, what are the gaps? Where do we need to start looking to, uh, to create new uh, materials, content, or other resources? And so briefly, I'll just touch about how we are looking at uh, these, the UN Sustainable Development Goals in their applications to geodesy. I'm uh, not going to go through all, all of this. I think uh, the Sustainable Development Goals are fairly uh, well known. It's, it's, a, it's a, a campaign that has been going on since 2015. And uh, they're trying to find ways of answering the big problems. So getting back to disasters, we, uh, we talked with our colleagues at the Group on Earth Observations and say, okay, so of these 17 sustainable development goals, which are the ones that you think are the most applicable to disasters? And they said, well, we, we think it's these three. So no poverty, sustainable cities and communities, and climate action. And so they kind of the UN uh, Office of Disaster Risk Reduction also offered some interpretation, and this is, this is a bit tangled, but it, it can give you an idea as to how some of these frameworks are sort of connected. It's, it's, uh, it's not immediately something that they say in, say, the SDGs. It will, does not specifically say this is also the same thing as a certain Sendai target. But what we're trying to do is find these, use these linkages that our friends in the Earth Observations community have already identified and use that as a stepping stone for us to further identify how does geodesy factor into all of this. And so just to look at a little bit more about a the few of the sustainable development goals that w we're thinking about uh, applying to, uh, to geodesy and so there's one here about uh, 
you know, sustainable cities and communities, and talking about uh, disaster damage to critical infrastructure. How can we, how can we use geos geodetic data to help assess uh, damages? Another interesting thing is, uh, is one on air quality, where they talk about the mean levels of fine particulate matter. And uh, there are some uh, techniques in GNSS radio occultation that could actually be a contributing factor to monitoring this. And so the important thing with these goals is that it's not just to uh, say that you are interested in these things, but it's also quantifiable. So you have the goal, which is the general idea, the sub-goal, really, and then the indicator is really how do you measure it. And so we are looking at how can geodesy, what are ways that geodesy is already contributing to this, that we can just identify this and say, without doing any ec extra work, or just a small am amount of extra work, we can start saying not only is our work contributing towards uh, what we said we would do, but we're also contributing towards this big UN campaign. We're also contributing towards disaster risk reduction. So it's about trying to make the most of what we already have. Okay, five minutes. <laughs> I won't read all of these, but it, it's something that, that we can look at and just think about for, your, for yourself if you have the opportunity to read a little bit more about some of these things and think about how your work might be contributing especially to these indicators, these, these methods of me measurement. I guess. There we go. <laughs> uh, are there questions or comments? So uh, uh, this is a very large, um, how I say, work with uh, with acronyms and elements here, elements there, and Alison finds always finds the the right way to ex uh, explain these things. So, take advantage and ask her something. No? No comments? Okay, thank you. And uh, the last presentation of this session is related to CIRGAS. It will be given by Virginia Marker. Marker, uh, Virginia is professor at the Universidad Nacional de Cuyo in Mendoza, Argentina and she is the present vice president of CIRGAS. Well, my, my pictures are in English, so I speak in Spanish for all our Latin American community. Um, esta presentación eh, ha sido revisada por el presidente de CIRGAS, William Martínez, quien está hoy con nosotros, y los tres presidentes de grupo, Víctor Ciose, del grupo de trabajo 1, eh, Silvio Freitas del Grupo de Trabajo 3 y eh, nuestro querido Roberto Pérez Rodino no ha podido estar con nosotros porque tiene un problema de salud ayer este, nos hizo saber que ya no iba a venir así que les mando un fuerte abrazo para todos Bueno, eh, CIRGAS inició, fue creado en el año 1993, 26 años de vida. En, en esta reunión que se realizó en Asunción en el año 1993, están presentes, estuvieron presentes dos amigos de CIRGAS desde siempre. Germán Dreves, hoy aquí presente, con unas canas más, y mmm, Luis Pablo Sotofortes, colega brasilero, muy comprometido con CIRGAS desde el principio, fue nuestro primer presidente de CIRGAS. Desde allí, tan joven, hasta hoy, aquí presente como comité organizador local, siempre comprometido con CIRGAS. CIRGAS eh, también tiene un acrónimo, 
Sirigas, Sistema de Referencia Geocéntrico para América del Sur, fue el primer nombre en el año 93, porque el objetivo fue eh, definir un marco de referencia único para América del Sur. Luego, en el año 2000, se realizó la segunda campaña que incluyó América Central y América del Norte, por lo cual Sirgas pasó a denominarse Sistema de Referencia Geocéntrico para las Américas. Desde el 2001 hasta hoy, ese es el acrónimo de Sirgas. Otra, otra institución importante eh, que avaló a Sirgas fue la eh, conferencia, la séptima conferencia cartográfica de Naciones Unidas realizada en Nueva York en el año 2001, en la cual se recomienda la adopción de CIRGAS como, marco de, como sistema de referencia oficial en todos los países de América. Eh, los objetivos de CIRGAS están conformados eh, desde nuestros tres grupos de trabajo, desde luego. Bueno, en primer lugar, eh, la definición de un sistema de referencia geocéntrico tridimensional. Eh, CIRGAS adopta totalmente las convenciones provistas por IAG. Eh, cabe mencionar que IAG fue... Eh, un, eh, tuvo, eh, CIRGAS tuvo el patrocinio de IAG desde los comienzos, desde aquella reunión en Asunción, igual que el Instituto Panamericano de Geografía e Historia, también fue el, el precursor de CIRGAS desde sus inicios y en los inicios también eh, la Agencia de Defensa Cartográfica de los Estados Unidos. Eh, bueno, eh, continuando con los objetivos, la realización del marco de referencia geocéntrico eh, que se logra a través de, de un eh, grupo de coordenadas geocéntricas de alta precisión y sus variaciones en el tiempo. Esta es la misión, el objetivo que debe cumplir el grupo de trabajo 1. La densificación continental, o sea, hacia el interior de los países que son miembros de CIRGAS, es la misión del Grupo de Trabajo 2, al igual que todas las aplicaciones prácticas y eh, de aporte a la ciencia. Y finalmente, la definición y realización de un sistema de referencia vertical unificado para todos los países miembros de CIRGAS, que se basa en la combinación de las alturas físicas y geométricas, su determinación y su variación en el tiempo, el objetivo del grupo de trabajo 3. Bueno, nosotros también tenemos una estructura no tan grande como IAG, pero tiene la mirada de IAG y eh, con el objetivo de cumplir los objetivos. Eh, bueno, en esta estructura nosotros vemos acá un primer bloque, ese primer bloque está conformado por el, el comité directivo de CIRGA, el consejo directivo de CIRGAS está formado por los representantes de cada uno de los países miembros, son 21 países miembros, y un representante por la Asociación Internacional de Geodesia, que ha sido siempre el doctor Germán Dreves, y por el Instituto Panamericano de Geografía e Historia, que eh, es Héctor Robera, hoy también aquí presente entre nosotros. Eh, como les dije, estas dos instituciones son las que siempre han apoyado a CIRGAS, bien lo mencionó ayer nuestro presidente. Eh, luego tenemos el comité ejecutivo, el comité ejecutivo formado por el presidente, el vicepresidente, en este momento quien les habla, que ya soy saliente, y eh, un presidente por cada uno de nuestros tres grupos de trabajo. Y ese comité ejecutivo trabaja muy mano a mano con el Consejo Científico de CIRGAS, que eh, hoy están aquí presentes casi todos nuestros eh, miembros, Luis Pablo, Laura, Germán y el doctor Brunini, que no nos ha podido acompañar también por problemas de salud. Eh, bueno, luego desde la presidencia de esos eh, tres grupos, eh, tenemos eh, a la gente que trabaja dentro de CIRGAS. La gente que trabaja en el Grupo 1 está conformada por eh, los integrantes de los centros de procesamiento. Ahí solo estoy mencionando el nombre de los centros de procesamiento. Hay mucha gente detrás de cada uno de los centros y las instituciones que los respaldan. Los eh, centros de datos, 
eh, los dos centros de combinación que tenemos en Alemania, en el DGFI y en Brasil, aquí en IBG, y los centros de análisis atmosférico, eh, por un lado la ionósfera en la Universidad de La Plata y la atmósfera neutra en el grupo que lideró en Mendoza, Argentina. Eh, bueno, nuestro grupo E2 está conformado por los representantes nacionales y además eh, por el grupo de tiempo real. Nosotros tenemos un grupo pequeño, pero que ha sido eh, muy activo durante los últimos 10 años en tiempo real. Eh, y finalmente nuestro grupo de trabajo 3, dirigido, eh, presidido por el doctor Silvio Freitas, eh, en el cual eh, la misión se ha delegado un poco también en dos eh, bloques, eh, por un lado el centro de datos que tenemos en el IBG y en el DGFI y el centro de análisis también en estas dos instituciones. Hay allí también un grupo de gente que trabaja este, coordinada por Silvio. Bueno, aquí les presento nuestros, eh, nuestras nuevas autoridades. Sonia Costa de Brasil es la presidenta, quien eh, ejercerá la presidencia a partir de mañana. Y eh, Diego Piñón, este, el vicepresidente eh, eh, por Argentina. Bueno, respecto al marco de referencia, esa es nuestra red. Tiene eh, más de 506 estaciones, de las cuales 59 estaciones son estaciones IGS. Eh, de esas 506 estaciones, el 73% de las estaciones está activa. Eh, lamentablemente hay eh, un 19% de estaciones que se han perdido por distintos motivos, terremotos, destrucciones de, de tormentas o bien falta de mantenimiento en la infraestructura. Y eh, hay un 8%, 38 estaciones que están inactivas, o sea, pueden retomar, pero en este momento están inactivas. Esto es eh, los números a octubre del 2019. Eh, un gran número de ellas tiene eh, GPS y GLONAS, un número menor también recibe Galileo y 43 estaciones que tienen eh, también Galileo y Beitio. Bueno, nuestro marco de referencia se apoya en el... En el, la red IGS, a partir de ese, de ese grupo de estaciones, que permiten semana a semana introducir el marco de referencia en nuestras soluciones. Y aquí una, una idea de la calidad de las soluciones semanales, eh, un error medio cuadrático de un milímetro y medio eh, por los dos centros de combinación, como podemos ver ahí. Vamos a ver algunos detalles sobre las soluciones del último año enseguida. Bueno, acá un poco el reconocimiento de todas las institu instituciones que participan en este grupo de trabajo. Podemos ver allí las banderas, eh, es un grupo muy eh, representativo de los países de América Latina este, y las instituciones que cobijan a nuestros centros de procesamiento. Hay un centro de procesamiento europeo que es en el DGFI, la responsable, eh, la doctora Laura Sánchez, eh, y luego tenemos 12 instituciones latinoamericanas, incluidos ahí los dos centros de atmósfera. Eh, bueno, recientemente eh, cabe destacar eh, la incorporación de un centro de procesamiento más en Chile, en la Universidad de Santiago. Eh, bueno, el, el tema de la red es una red densa, nuestros centros de procesamiento eh, tienen una distribución de estaciones. Eh, con estas barritas he querido señalar la situación del último año. A enero, en el verde oscuro, podemos ver la cantidad de estaciones que tenían que procesar cada uno de los centros de procesamiento. Eh, y marco acá es junio y noviembre del 2019. Eh, en enero del 2019 deja de eh, operar el centro de procesamiento de la Universidad Nacional de Costa Rica, eh, la UNA, eh, por motivos que, de decisiones administrativas, eh, los cuales realmente no terminamos de, de comprender, pero bueno, son parte de las políticas de las instituciones. 
Eh, lo cual hace que eh, la, el grupo de estaciones que procesaba fuera, debió ser distribuido a otros centros de procesamiento. Ahí ven que se empiezan a recargar algunos de los centros de procesamiento. Eh, en ese interín eh, también empieza a tener problemas eh, la Universidad de Zulia, eh, Venezuela, por los problemas que, que todos conocemos, ese centro de procesamiento... Eh, no dispone de tiempo operativo de energía eléctrica y internet para poder operar rutinariamente como lo venía haciendo pero lijamente y dado los requerimientos de tiempo y forma eh, debió ser eh, demandada esa, esa red a otros centros de cálculo. Entonces este año tuvimos dos cambios, por suerte tuvimos a los colegas de Santiago de Chile que se estaban perfilando ya desde el año pasado, debían cumplir su etapa de un año de experimentales, pero los alentamos para que iniciaran rápidamente y fueron oficializados antes del, del año, antes de cumplir el año, porque necesitábamos recargar a ellos parte de la red que no podían procesar estos centros de procesamiento. Y por otro lado, eh, tuvimos el ofrecimiento de Laura de también retomar eh, un gran número de estaciones, de esas estaciones que debían ser eh, delineadas a otro centro y gracias al esfuerzo del DGFI también pudimos eh, salvar ese momento. Bueno, nuestras felicitaciones al Centro de Procesamiento de USACH y gracias al DGFI. Bueno, la calidad de las soluciones de CIRGA siempre se han eh, mantenido eh, con dentro de los estándares que mencionó eh, eh, Harald en, en su presentación y Germán Dreves ayer y Richard Gross, ¿no? nos piden el milímetro y bueno, detrás de eso estamos. En, en planimetría, en, en norte y este, el, el, la precisión interna controlada a partir de nuestras soluciones semanales con respecto a la solución de la semana previa, eh, tanto para el centro de procesamiento de, de, perdón, esto es la combinación, tanto el centro de combinación de Brasil como el centro de combinación del DGFI muestran eh, la calidad, el, el error medio cuadrático de esas, de esas comparaciones en norte y este estamos en el milímetro y en altura un poquito peor. Eh, si hacemos la comparación externa, semana a semana, a partir de la comparación con las estaciones IGS que conforman cada una de las semanas, que participan cada una de las semanas, ese número varía entre 68 y 78 estaciones, eh, bueno, también vemos eh, la calidad del marco de referencia, tanto en la combinación del IBG como en la combinación del DGFI. Bueno, eso marca y nos da tranquilidad de las soluciones eh, de CIRGAS. Bueno, nuestra página web eh, eh, trata de tener, de volcar toda la información actualizada de todo lo que se va generando dentro de CIRGAS, eh, tanto lo, lo administrativo, organizativo, de la estructura y de los representantes nacionales, como de los productos. Eh, tenemos el lujo de que nuestra página web se encuentra en los tres idiomas que se hablan dentro de CIRGAS, español, portugués y inglés. Eh, cabe mencionar nuestro agradecimiento a dos colegas que los hemos conocido en este simposio, al menos por mí, eh, Wagner estuvo la semana pasada en el workshop participando y tuve el, el gran honor de darle un abrazo y, y la gratitud y a Gabriel he tenido la oportunidad de conocerlo ayer, hoy aquí formalmente les damos la, las gracias porque ellos se encargan de la traducción al portugués. Y desde luego a Laura Sánchez con su apoyo permanente porque ella mantiene la página web en, 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 el, en la estructura de, de GFI. Bueno, los invito a visitarla eh, porque tiene toda nuestra información. Vamos a los productos. Los productos principales de CIRGAS son el monitoreo de las estaciones a través de las coordenadas. Eh, tenemos eh, eh, las coordenadas eh, semanales semilibres que van al, a la solución del poliedro global del IGS semana a semana. 
las eh, coordenadas semanales en el marco de referencia, actualmente ITRF14, acá hay una muestra de lo que es el monitoreo semana a semana de cada una de las estaciones. Y después tenemos las soluciones multianuales, la última solución multianual do, del 2017, con el grupo de coordenadas y el grupo de velocidades con sus correspondientes precisiones. Esto ha permitido generar eh, los mapas de velocidades, ahí podemos ver los últimos mapas de velocidades, y desde luego los modelos de velocidades que son muy usados dentro de la comunidad CIRGAS, los cuales es necesario ir este, renovando por periodos, dado la situación eh, de deformación que se produce en toda la zona de los Andes por los distintos terremotos que han ocurrido. Entonces ahí vemos estos eh, modelos. Estos modelos responden a eh, su aplicación en distintos eh, periodos eh, según el caso de los distintos terremotos acaecidos. Bueno, en, desde el grupo de trabajo 2, les mencioné, tenemos eh, 21 países miembros de CIRGAS, pero 15 eh, de los países han eh, adoptado sus marcos de referencia densificando a CIRGAS. Eh, dentro de nuestra página web, ustedes pueden ver la lista de las redes que densifican CIRGAS en cada uno de los países, al igual que eh, la época a la que refieren. Eh, en el grupo de trabajo 2 eh, se ha encaminado en estos 26 años en eh, delinear eh, distintas políticas para relacionar eh, y guiar ¿no? a los países para eh, ver cómo relacionar el marco activo eh, geocéntrico que está eh, materializado por nuestra red CIRGASCOM con las densificaciones nacionales que en la mayoría de los casos se basan en puntos activos pero la densificación son puntos pasivos, o sea estaciones GNSS de reocupación. Eh, bueno, otros productos, ayer eh, tuvimos la sesión en donde eh, las colegas de, de Argentina eh, mostraron eh, los productos de retardo cenital tropoférico. Estos productos que son generados, como la ingeniera Mateo ayer mencionó, están hoy en la página web de CIRGAS, en el menú Troposferic Delay, en, en la estructura de eh, año, día y dentro del día eh, un archivo por estación. Este, eso es un producto de este año. Es un producto de mucho trabajo, pero que este año ya eh, ha sido validado. Eh, bueno, eh, Laura ayer mencionó eh, la validación en el estado de retardo cenital tropoférico y eh, la validación del producto de vapor de agua. Por ahora, lo que está publicado en la página es el retardo cenital tropoférico. Eh, aquí podemos ver eh, estos mapas. Estos mapas nosotros los estamos generando eh, para cada eh, grupo de datos que tenemos de retardo cenital tropoférico. Cada una hora o cada dos horas según el estado de, de cálculo que, que tiene nuestra red. En los primeros años, 2014, el retardo cenital se calculaba cada dos horas, por eso está cada dos horas, actualmente cada una hora. Ahí puse a modo de ejemplo un video de eh, una semana de 15 días de, de datos. Bueno, el sistema vertical, el grupo 3 eh, se ha ocupado de compilar toda la información de alturas, tanto físicas como geométricas, en los distintos países eh, y la eh, del, delineación de los distintos eh, eh, datums o ceros de cada uno de los países. Esto fue un trabajo que hizo hace varios años la doctora Laura Sánchez, que han servido de guía a nuestro grupo de trabajo 3 por tantísimos años. Eh, el grupo 3 se ha encargado de reunir la información de nivelación GNSS sobre las estaciones altimétricas y gravedad, es una tarea que, permanentemente, que, que realizan permanentemente y eh, hace unos años este, están abocados a eh, la determinación de 22 puntos eh, que van a a formar parte del marco de referencia de las alturas internacional, esos que podemos ver ahí, cada 
cada país se ha encargado o está en la tarea de eh, brindar eh, toda la información necesaria eh, requerida en este caso. Eh, vamos a ver trabajos de esto el día jueves. Eh, bueno, y ir, para ir terminando, eh, para, eh, para CIRGA siempre ha sido fundamental el entrenamiento, la capacitación. Eh, yo considero que hemos llegado a incorporar tanta gente en nuestros grupos de trabajo gracias a las capacitaciones que se han dado en el entorno de CIRGAS. Las escuelas se han realizado... Uy, perdón. Eh, se han realizado eh, seis escuelas eh, 14 workshops, incluimos el de la semana pasada, eh, más de 436 personas han sido capacitadas en esos workshops y 603 en las escuelas. Eh, más de 1.850 personas han participado de nuestros simposios. Eh, ahí podemos ver, en algunos años hemos tenido más participación que en otros, por lo general cuando se han hecho las escuelas había mucha participación. Eh, en el último año han habido dos instancias, eh, una eh, nos reunimos en Buenos Aires gracias al esfuerzo de Laura, Claudio y Germán que organizaron el workshop en el cual varios de ustedes eh, asistieron, fue muy, muy interesante para la comunidad sirgas y eh, el workshop de la semana pasada fue excelente, eh, hemos agradecido enormemente a la doctora Teller por el tiempo que nos ha dedicado, ahí pueden ver, fuimos 25 miembros de CIRGAS que nos hemos eh, capacitado en la técnica SLR y le damos las gracias tanto a Daniela como a BKG como a las instituciones organizadoras locales por habernos brindado ese espacio. Eh, bueno, muchos son los centros de datos de CIRGAS, los centros de procesamiento y de combinación. Hay una gran cantidad de, de docentes dentro del espacio de CIRGAS, docentes que están desde las universidades o de los institutos que capacitan y siguen capacitando a más gente. A todos muchas gracias y seguimos esperando su colaboración. En este caso, el agradecimiento... Eh, por este, el apoyo en este simposio, hemos, tenido de, hemos recibido del proyecto de IPGH presentado este año eh, dinero para ayudar a 16 eh, asistentes que están hoy aquí y de IAG agradecemos como cada año eh, la, la ayuda, en este caso fueron cinco eh, jóvenes que recibieron ayuda de IAG. Bueno, muchísimas gracias a los organizadores locales porque la verdad que nos están acogiendo de la mejor manera. Nada más, gracias. Are there questions for Virginia? What the big, biggest difficulty? to be ahead to seekers in the last year? <coughs> para mí, para mí, eh, no poder... Ay, please, discul disculpen. Para mí, no poder resolver lo del Centro de Procesamiento de la Universidad de Costa Rica. Porque aquí tenemos sentados a los colegas de Costa Rica. José, eh, Jorge Moya. Excelente, excelente colaborador, siempre fue excelente colaborador él y sus colegas. Tienen la, el apoyo de la universidad, están aquí, pero la universidad decide que no sean centro, que no sigan siendo centro de procesamiento. Si lo están haciendo bien, le ayuda al país, lo necesita el país, ¿por qué no? Sirgas no le pide más que un poco de trabajo, el trabajo que él hace y que su gente hace, porque le, la universidad le pide que haga ciencia, entonces él hace esa tarea, le ayuda, le da nivel para que él pueda trabajar y generar productos de ciencia de calidad. ¿Por qué no las autoridades no lo apoyan para seguir siendo un centro de procesamiento serias? Está junto a él Álvaro, de Costa Rica, están fortaleciéndose mutuamente para generar un centro de procesamiento en el Instituto Geográfico de Costa Rica, en el registro de Costa Rica. O sea, los, los técnicos 
están en acuerdo. El problema pareciera ser un problema político. Yo no lo entiendo. Para mí eso fue una gran dificultad. Eh, Virginia, algo que no mencionaste en tu informe y quiero, quiero enfatizar es tu trabajo en estos cuatro años como vicepresidente. Para quienes no lo saben, en general no lo saben, es un trabajo oculto de hormiguita. Todos los simposios desde 2016 al presente, la funcionalidad, la continuidad del grupo de trabajo 1, toda esa coordinación junto con el querido Víctor de la Universidad del Zulia, nuestro presidente del grupo de trabajo 1, es increíble la cantidad de comunicaciones, de insistencias, de favores, de lazos que, hay, que hay, se mueven en esta red humana y técnica para que funcionen los centros de procesamiento y este grupo se mantenga. Yo quiero pedir especialmente un, un gran aplauso para ti por tu gestión. Hermosísima. Y un último comentario, muy pequeñito, es un crédito. En la fotografía de la primera lámina, otro protagonista es nuestro querido amigo Napoleón de Venezuela, que también nos acompaña en esta reunión. Muchas gracias eh, también al querido Luis Paulo y a Sonia por esta organización. Muchísimas gracias por tenernos acá eh, con todas estas rock stars de la geodesia del río. <risa> Gracias. Ahí está Napoleón. Sí, claro. okay. Bueno, muchas gracias. Todavía tenía cabello en esa época. Por eso es que uno no lo reconoce. Eh, ¿Algún otro? Eh, ¿Any other comment? Or, uh, if not, the coffee is waiting for you. And we, ah, just a second. And we reconvene in 20 minutes. Okay, I, I say it again today in English because we have uh, many new uh, participants from GIGOS. I'd like to remember you that tomorrow evening we are going to have the symposium uh, dinner that's going to be held at the Churrascaria Rodizio. That means you pay a fixed price and eat as much as you want. It's going to be held uh, in Churrascaria Carretão. It's located in Panema, which is not far from... Copacabana, the hotels in Copacabana and Ipanema, and it's just across the street for the General Osorio subway station. That's very convenient. So please, uh, all of you who want to attend this dinner, you need to give your names to Cristiane, who is uh, just outside at the hall, for her to be able to make the reservation today for the dinner tomorrow. Okay? Thank you. Una, una cosa antes que salgan los colegas de Brasil sobre todo. Mañana ten, ay, después en, en portugués. En portugués. Oh, os colegas do Brasil, por favor, fiquen. Eh, amanhã teremos uma re, a reunião do grupo de trabalho 2 a respeito do GNSS em tempo real. E nós gostaríamos de contar com a participação de vocês também, principalmente as universidades, se têm interesse em trabalhar com a, a, os dados de INSS em tempo real. As reuniões estão sendo na sala H, aqui no andar de cima. É só ir para o lado de fora, à, à direita tem uma escada, sala H. Então, espero a presença de... Sim, que falem com Virgínia, os que querem, querem estar participando, informe a ela. Amanhã ao meio-dia. Meio-dia, ao meio-dia. Depois da última, da última palestra aqui. Ok? Coffee break. Sei, estou dando para ela aqui. Procura um arquivo MP4. Esse pen drive. Que não vai vir apresentar. Isso. Senta aqui. Ah, já copiou? Já está funcionando? Já testou? Uhum. Tá. Não, tá, eu testei em casa. Só está faltando duas
Aló, aló, aló. Sí, ya. Okay. Hello, good morning again. We are ready to, to continue with this block of sessions. Uh, the next presentation is titled The Agigos Bureau of Products and Standard, and it will, uh, this presentation will be given by uh, Detlef Angerman. He is a research associate of the Deutsches Geodetisches Forschungsinstitut at the Technical University of München. Yeah. Oh, no. He is chair of the GIGOS Bureau of Products and Standards. So good morning. Welcome uh, to my presentation. Uh, so I would like to uh, give you an overview on the activities and uh, of the GIGOS Bureau of Products and Standards. I would to like uh, I would like to acknowledge the uh, contributions of uh, the team members of uh, the bureau, which you see here, and and two of them are with within us here in the room. So Laura and and also Thomas Gruber. Let me start with a brief overview. Uh, so on the top uh, level, you see the different uh, geodetic observations classified in point positioning techniques, surveys, surface scanning, and gravity measurements. And on the um, bottom level, you see the geodetic products. And so typically, they are classified in the so-called three pillars in geometry, earth rotation, and gravity field. And uh, as you all know, uh, for the product generation, the fundamental requirement are geodetic reference frames, which should be very precise and long-term stable. And in, in between, uh, there's the data analysis. And as you all know, this is really complex. <coughs> with, with increasing accuracy requirements, uh, it's getting more and more complicated. Many different analysis centers and combination centers are involved to generate the geodetic products. And um, another important issue is for the data analysis, you need um, well-defined standards, numerical standards, processing standards, and you need a variety of different models, geophysical models, models for the each of the individual techniques, and so you can imagine is uh, very complicated. And uh, an important requirement is that all the different standards are, and models are uh, consistently applied for the different uh, space geodetic observing t uh, systems. And this is the, pre the key focus of the GIGOS Bureau of Products and Standards. A key goal of, of GIGOS is the integration of the different obse uh, observation techniques um, to obtain consistent products for uh, geometry, gravity field, and Earth rotation. And as I mentioned already, the key element in this procedure are consistent and highly precise reference frames. This slide was already shown by, by Richard Gross, so I don't want to, to reap, uh, repeat the things. I just would like uh, to address your attention to the GIGOS Bureau of Products and Standards with, with its components. Uh, and I would like to, to mention at this point that it's um, <coughs> an important issue is the interaction between the GIGOS and in particular between the Bureau of Products and Standards and the IAG services, because the IAG services, they produce the products, and so we don't want to duplicate the things within the BPS. We are using the products which are generated with by the IAG services already, and the focus is on the integration and to get consistent products for the uh, Earth observing system. And uh, this is also addressed here on the very... Uh, uh, Bottom here, uh, GIGOS is built upon the foundation provided by the IAG components, and this is really important to keep that in mind. And there's also, as you see here in this uh, figure, 
a close interaction uh, between the uh, Rigos Bureau of Products and Standards and the IES Convention Centers regarding the development of standards and conventions. This slide was also shown already by, by Richard. Uh, I just would like to address a few points here. So the uh, objectives of the Bureau are, are multifold. So one objective is a more general one. The Bureau should serve as contact and coordinating po point for the homogenization of uh, IAG standards and products. And a key issue is really to keep track of the adopted <laughs> geodetic standards and conventions across all IAG components and to initiate steps to close gaps and deficiencies. Other important issues are uh, to focus on the integration of uh, geometric and gravimetric parameters and also in the direction to develop new, new products that are needed for earth sciences and society. This figure here uh, on the bottom should illustrate the importance of uh, consistent standards and consistent ge geodetic products for that purpose to integrate uh, the different uh, parameters, geometry, uh, earth orientation, and uh, gravity field in order to get a consistent system for monitoring earth. This is the organizational structure of the Bureau. So the Bureau is hosted at the Technical University of Munich. Um, here you see uh, the BPS uh, staff members. Um, so the Bureau is located at the Technical University of Munich, but it's uh, supported also by uh, members of GFZ, uh, Robert Heinkelmann, and uh, by uh, Peter Steigenberger from DLR. Uh, the entities associated to the BPS include uh, two committees. Um, one is the Committee on Earth uh, System Modeling, shared uh, by uh, Mike Thomas. The other one is the Committee on Essential Geodetic Variables, shared by Richard Gross. And Richard also introduced this uh, committee in the morning. Then we uh, had. We had two working groups. Uh, so one uh, was shared by Claude Boucher um, on ITS standards for ISO TC211. And this uh, working uh, group was uh, recently dissolved because the work has been completed. And uh, there is another uh, working group um, establishment on the global geodetic reference frame shared by Urs Marti. And as you know, the lifetime of uh, working groups with in IAG is uh, typically four years. And so the uh, plan now is uh, to continue with the work which was initiated by Urs Marti and to set up a new working group. And this, progress, uh, and this is in progress right now. Altogether, we have about uh, 25 representatives uh, which were designated by the IAG services and other relevant entities involved in standards and geo geodetic products. And uh, you see uh, the uh, members here in um, this table. Um, so here on the... Um, uh, top, you uh, see the representatives for the geometric services. <coughs> here is the gravity part, and here on the uh, bottom level, you uh, see the other representatives. The list is, is quite long already, and uh, there are several members uh, which are uh, retired meanwhile, and, uh, but they are still listed here on, on this to to acknowledge their valuable contributions. For example, from Gérard Petit concerning the IES conventions. And also, um, Johannes uh, Ide is uh, retired uh, meanwhile, but he did a lot of work for concerning the standards and the combination of geometry and gravi gravity. Also, Franz Patelm is uh, retired. And uh, recently, also, Catherine Höhenkerk uh, representing the Astronomical Union. So one of the key topics of the Bureau is to keep, stun, uh, keep uh, track of the uh, geodetic uh, standards used for the uh, generation of products. 
And in this framework, a key issue was uh, the compilation of an inventory of standards and conventions used for the generation of IAG products. And this has been published in the IAG Geodesist Handbook 2016. The contents you see here on the right uh, hand side, the document uh, comprises about uh, 60 page pages. And Major issues were to assess the present status concerning the product generation, to identify gaps, and to provide recommendations. This was done in interaction with uh, all the different IAG components. And now it's already four years uh, since this has been published in the uh, Geodesist Handbook, and so many thing things have to be updated, and we, we have been working on these updates, and. The second version of this inventory is almost f finalized. So the updates mainly uh, are related to, uh, to the structure of IAG and GIGOS. Uh, some general issues and uh, also issues on numerical standards have been updated. And since the publication of this in 2016, we have a new I, uh, IES products, which have also to be considered, the ICF3. Uh, in this period also there was a change from ITF 2008 to ITF 2014 and also the series of the Earth orientation parameters has been updated. Updates are also for the other components which we uh, addressed in this inventory, for example the GNS orbits, the gravity uh, field activities and the activities related to the height system. The second version of this inventory will be published online at the GIGOS website and the planned date for that is uh, January next year. So we will take into account the new IAG GIGOS structure for this publication of the document. Now another important issue um, of our work is related to the numerical standards because they provides a background for the data uh, production and, and uh, the generation of, of products. The situation is that uh, the geodetic reference system from 1980 uh, still provides the conventional values. And this has been released, the GS80 has been released about 40 years ago. So the numerical standards providing there are rather outdated. Uh, uh, now and so for the processing updated values are, are used and so the bases are provided to a large extent by the IES conventions which are continuously updated and but in, in the case of the gravity field uh, also different standards are used. You see here as you see here in this table so the semi-major axis for EGM 2008 differs from the IES conventions. And uh, we also have new IAG, IAG resolutions, as for example for W0 in 2015, which you see here also in this table. This, values has, this value has been adapted in the IAS conventions recently, or in, in 2017. And uh, the main summary on this is the geodetic work is based on different numerical standards. And so thus uh, a unique and consistent set of numerical standards does not exist within IAG and moreover different time and tide systems are in use. And so this situation is not satisfying at all. So it makes the use of geodetic products rather uh, difficult and for the users is really confusing because they must know on which standards the products rely. And so we provided uh, from the BPS uh, recommendations on this numerical standards and really an important re recommendation is so long as we have to live with this uh, different standards at least we should uh, ensure that the used numerical standards including the time and tide systems are clearly documented for all geodetic products. And recommendation, recommendation two, I think, is uh, already uh, fulfilled that the new W0 value is really used for geodetic work. But the recommendation three is a big issue. So we are working in the direction 
to develop a new geodetic reference system for, uh, which should be based on the best estimates of the major uh, parameters. And this is a topic also of the uh, new uh, working group uh, shared by, by Urs Marty. He will address this issue in detail. Now, very briefly, um, a, a view on the IES products uh, for the celestial reference frame, the Earth orientation parameters, and for the terrestrial reference frame. Um, the inventory provides for each of these pro uh, product uh, about three to four recommendations, but I will not address this here today because that uh, are I think too many details. I just would mention three general recommendations for the IES product, and uh, so the first one, the most important, in, from my opinion, is that we should achieve consistency between the celestial reference frame, the terrestrial reference frame, and the Earth orientation parameters. This fo was formulated already eight years ago in an IUGG resolution and uh, has been formulated now in, in Montreal also in an IAG resolution uh, 2019 to stress this point again. And another important issue is that the processing standard should be consistently applied by all analysis centers and you can imagine that this is really a big issue. For example, the ITF production, uh, you have four different observation techniques, many an analysis centers involved many different software packages and uh, so it's, but it is important to really get consistent results. And another important uh, requirement uh, relates more to the next talk to the Bureau of Networks and Observations, but I would like to mention this here. Uh, the basis for the product uh, ge the generation are the data and the stations who are doing these observations uh, and so really have to stress to, to improve the geodetic net networks for this purpose. All the things within the IES are ongoing activities uh, of the IES and the contributing uh, IAG services. And uh, also I have to mention in this context the unified analysis workshop which really addresses all the issues related to the um, uh, data processing and combination to generate consistent products and so the last one was in Paris just one month ago and concerning the celestial reference frame the IAU is involved. Gravity related products, a lot of progress has been achieved here. Uh, since a few years we have a central bureau uh, located in, in Greek uh, and uh, there is an updated uh, web page including dedicated products, portal metadata information and we have also um, the uh, service, the ICGEM service uh, who is providing a website on all the different gravity models which are openly available and uh, they also are providing DOIs for the different data sets. But there are many, many different uh, gravity fields and so for the user it's somehow difficult to decide which one they should use for their particular applications. So one issue is that uh, probably it would be a good idea if a conventional global gra uh, gravity model uh, would be uh, provided as an official IAG product and so this issue is under discussion. And it was also mentioned today by Harald that there is a new service for the combination of time variable gravity field solution. And we will hear more on the developments on the unified height system by Laura uh, this afternoon. Just an example here, uh, the uh, ICGEM uh, web page and here you see uh, that for uh, the gravity field model uh, DOIs are available. So uh, I looked at this web page yesterday. Now we have already the number 176. So you see that it's coming more and more models here. This was already mentioned by Allison in uh, quite some detail, the initiative of the United uh, Nations. Uh, there we have a subcommittee on geodesy consisting of five working groups 
And the working group on data sharing policy and standards is closely related to the activities of the BPS. This is uh, shared by uh, Mike Kramer, uh, and uh, I was nominated at, as the IAG representative in, in this uh, working group here. A major outcome was um, the uh, roadmap implementation plan, which, which was provided to the UN GGIM committee of experts. And there, three recommendations were provided. So the first one on open data sharing, and we know there are a lot of limit limitations. So the second uh, issue is how to resolve uh, the concerns that currently limit data sh sharing and the third one is that uh, to support that common standards are uh, openly available and used by all nations. This is on the Committee on Essential Geodetic Variables. This was also presented in the morning by, by Richard, so I can be very short here. Um, important to mention is that uh, the global ocean and the global climate observing system they have defined already essential variables for the ocean and for the climate. And here you see some examples for the climate variables uh, classified here in atmospheric, oceanic, and terrestrial uh, parts. And you see here that uh, several of, of these uh, variables are also measured by uh, geodesy, for example, sea level, water vapor, uh, etc. And so we can learn a lot from uh, the other observing systems and so uh, in geodesy, uh, we also we, we are quite clear about some examples which should be essential geodetic variables. And uh, as Richard also, also mentioned, this essential geodetic variables could then serve as a basis for a gap analysis, analysis to identify requirements. Here uh, are the uh, members of the committee. And uh, so this is my... Um, Last slide, just, just summarizing the uh, ongoing uh, activities and planned actions of the Bureau. So the first item is uh, really an important issue to uh, continue the work regarding standards and conventions in interaction with IAG components and other entities involved. So the second one, uh, makes clear the close interaction between the Bureau and the IES Convention. So the Bureau is involved in the rewriting, revising of the IES Conventions, mainly for Chapter 1, which is the general, general definitions and numerical standards. Then uh, a long-term activity is to focus on the integration of geometric and gravimetric observations and to support the development of integrated products. So some examples are explicitly given here. And important is also the interaction with external uh, stakeholders involved in, in standards, for example, ISO, IAU, and uh, all the UN GGIM activities. I mentioned uh, the contributions to the uh, UN GGIM working group data sharing and development of geodetic standards. And we also contribute to the Committee on Essential Geodetic Variables, and we are currently working on a new implementation plan for the next four years. Thank you very much. Okay, we have a minute for any question or comment. Um, no? Well, thank you very much. Okay, our now, our now uh, next uh, speaker is uh, Michael Perman. Uh, he's from Harvard at Smithsonian for Astrophysics, Director of the GIGOS Bureau of the Networks and Observatories, and Director of the Central Bureau of the International Laser um, Ranging Service. Uh, his presentation is titled The GIGOS Bureau of Networks and Observatories. Left, left or right? But, but I advance them by, by pushing these, these yeah. advances. Yeah, pushing it forward. Yeah, we'll, we'll try it. We'll see. Okay. 
All right. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come here and talk a little bit about the Bureau of Networks and Observations. Um, many of the things that I could have said here uh, have been presented by s uh, earlier speakers, so I'll, I'll not uh, belabor all of those. Uh, I put here uh, also uh, Kerry Knoll, who uh, helped greatly in putting these charts together. Uh, but if I were to include uh, all the people who made contributions, I probably would have needed two pages. So let me just tell you that we have a cast of many people who worked on this. You saw this chart before. Um, we are the Bureau, down here circled. Uh, the Bureau has uh, in it uh, the uh, IAG network, uh, the networks, uh, uh, representatives, uh, in particular uh, the ILRS, IVS, IDS, and, I and IGS that are uh, involved with the uh, development of the reference frame, uh, but there are also other services, particularly the gravity field, uh, 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 the tide gauges, that uh, also need to be uh, more closely integrated uh, into the uh, into the networks. Uh, we also have uh, a committee, or one on satellite uh, missions, and I'll talk in a minute about that, one on data and information systems, uh, one on uh, performance simulations and architectural trade-offs, and uh, we all affectionately refer to that as PLATO. It's easy to remember. Uh, we also have an IERS working group on uh, site survey and co-location, uh, and uh, they also have a, a, a connection uh, to, the, to the Bureau. Uh, these are the kinds of things that we do. Uh, we advocate for the expansion and the upgrade of the network. So we try and convince people, don't you want to build a laser system? Or don't you want to build a VOBI system? And occasionally they do. Uh, and, uh, and maybe they will uh, in, in the future. Uh, so. Uh, that's primarily focused on uh, the, the reference frame, but also uh, other uh, GIGO's priorities. So we encourage partnerships, uh, try and keep, uh, get people together, because building one of these stations, for instance, a, a core station that might have VLBI and SLR, uh, would be very expensive. And uh, also, of course, having core stations makes the uh, job of developing the reference frame a lot easier. Uh, because you have the VLBI and the SLR in close uh, proximity where they be con connected by ground surveys. We also, we organize the GIGOS affiliated network through a call for participation. And uh, we have now uh, well over 100 stations that are affiliated with the network. We have some others that we're working on and uh, we uh, expect them to uh, join shortly. Uh, we provide opportunities for the representatives of the services and the standing committees to meet, to talk about what they're doing, uh, to compare ideas, and uh, of course to learn, learn from uh, each other. So we discuss uh, some of the common issues. Uh, and we typically meet at EGU, AGU, GIGOS days, and uh, whenever else we, we can get people together. Um, we have uh, scoped uh, the network for the reference frame, and I believe there's a, a chart in here about it, is what would we need to get the millimeter reference frame that we've been, uh, been talking about? And uh, 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 starting out with the concept of using just the core sites uh, with the recognition that uh, that, that is in itself would not work. Uh, we maintain a site requirements document so this is for folks who are building a station uh, who need to get some idea as to what's involved, what are the issues, and, uh, and also what do I have to worry about. Uh, and uh, so that, that's available on the website. Uh, we monitor network status. Uh, we actually project network evolution on inputs that we get from the stations and what we can expect over the next five and ten years. So, for instance, if you're doing an analysis, if you're uh, trying to project how, how we'll be making a reference frame or a, a precision orbit determination uh, sometime in the future for a, a satellite or a, some program that you're planning, uh, we can give you some information. 
as to what we think the network may look like. No guarantees, and usually things slip a little bit, but uh, many of them come to fruition. Uh, we do talks, posters, you've probably seen some of the posters, some of the, uh, some of the talks at, uh, of the from, uh, on the Bureau at uh, some of the, the popular meetings. We write a lot of letters, documentation, to support stations, to support analysis groups, to uh, support missions, explaining to them why it's very important to support, G to support GIGOS. And the hope is that we are uh, all advocators and we are all in the advertising business for, uh, for Space Geodesy. Uh, and uh, we're also in the process right now of developing a uh, memorandum of understanding with the Roscosmos people in Russia. Uh, and their, their strongest interest is in uh, laser ranging, uh, but um, uh, they certainly are interested in, in uh, VLBI and GNSS and the other, other techniques. Okay, we have, in addition to our representatives from the uh, the services. We also have uh, four four committees. I mentioned the first one, the uh, Standing Committee on Performance Simulations and Architectural Trade-offs of Plato, and these folks uh, do uh, simulation studies and analysis to ex to uh, to uh, assess the impact on the reference frame or other products uh, if uh, certain things are, are done. For instance, if we can increase the performance of the stations, how much better do the, product, the products get? If we can add uh, a, a couple of stations in what we think are critical locations, how much better can the, can the products get? So that we have some basis of arguing for the importance of, of new stations and the importance of upgrading stations. Uh, and uh, some of you may have noticed uh, uh, Matthias, uh, M M Mathis Blasfeld has presented some recent papers uh, at uh, AGU and EGU and uh, some of the other meetings on um, some specific benefits that would be reached by adding a station or two here by improving performance of the stations that we have. Okay. We have a standing committee on data and information. Uh, this group is focused on a metadata uh, system development for uh, geodesy users and particular GIGOs. Uh, we have a, what we call the near-term uh, pr program, which is being done at CDDIS by Kerry Knoll. And this was to uh, develop a metadata system for um, uh, uh, data products. How do we get something out quickly that explains the data products that we're generating in, uh, uh, in, in all of the space geodesy area? In a more, uh, probably longer term, comprehensive longer-term plan for an all-inclusive system, not only the data products, but also all the infrastructure. I mean, what, what kinds of things do we have? What kinds of things do we make, a, make available? Uh, and that's underway by uh, Nick Brown at uh, Geoscience Australia. We have a standing committee on missions. Uh, these folks have been uh, interfacing with satellite missions. Uh, they documented uh, the uh, uh, impact that uh, satellites have had on, on GIGOS, uh, on how much impact new missions would have. Uh, so we advocate, we provide material, we provide letters in order to support new missions that are relevant to GIGOS. And, uh, and there, are, there are a lot of them. Uh, and we also um, have participation of the IERS Working Group on Site Survey and co-location. Uh, these folks are to be uh, encouraging uh, the uh, ground system surveys that support the uh, combination of space techniques. Uh, they're also very concerned in, in the uh, gravity deformation of VLBI antennas and uh, you know, how, do we, how do we do that in particular with the uh, VGOS now emerging, that is the new VLBI techniques some of the old antennas are going to disappear. And uh, what we really need to do is get the, the, the deformation models of those antennas before they're cut up for scrap and then uh, they, they disappear. 
All right, this is the configuration for uh, the core sites uh, for the reference frame, uh, the VLBI, Doris, SLR, and uh, the GNSS antenna. Uh, we also include a fifth element in the middle, which is the survey instrument to connect these. Okay. And un unfortunately, this has gotten a sor sort of the short end of the straw. Okay. There, there are really five techniques here, not four. And that, that ground survey is critical. And I can tell you just from, uh, we've been doing a, a very uh, a deep analysis looking at the SLR data. Uh, and uh, you'd be surprised all the stuff that we, we see. We have a, a, an engineer who's going back through all the files and looking at all the data and looking at all, all the, uh, the analyzed products. There's a lot of stuff in there. So on one hand, we're trying to build a network that, that'll get millimeter results. And on the other hand, centimeter things are probably slipping through. So probably the place to get you know, the low hanging fruit, as we say, is fixing up what we have. When we started out, uh, Erikos Pavlis did the, uh, an analysis and said, what would we need to get the millimeter uh, stations for the reference frame? So we've got to get, got to get a millimeter. So um, his, his analysis showed that if we did it with core sites, VLBI, SLR, GNSS, Doris, and we put them all together and we surveyed properly, he came out with the initial conclusion we were going to need 32 core sites. That's a lot of core sites and a lot of cost and, um, and very unlikely. Very unlikely that we're going to see that in the short order. Um, and what we, so, so what we understand is uh, there aren't going to be 32 core sites. Okay? And even if we had 32 core sites built, it's unlikely that we would find 32 really good locations that were not only geologically stable, okay, but also had clear skies for SLR, et cetera. Uh, so um, the, it, the, the message is very clear. Okay. Uh, we're very fortunate that analysis and modeling techniques have improved and are improving. So the burden w wouldn't quite be as heavy as Ericos had insisted. But we have to recognize that co-location sites, sites that may have only the VLBI and maybe Darvis and GNSS. Maybe they have um, SLR and GNSS. Okay. Those combination sites are going to be critical for a long time to come. We also have to realize now, and I think it has been, it may have been mentioned already, we also have co-location in space, okay? So the connection of observations using reference satellites you know, that have two or more of the techniques is also going to play a very big role in this, okay? And uh, even though it, we're talking about satellites, it may offer to be uh, economically uh, the, uh, the most efficient way to go. Uh, now, I mentioned earlier that we have uh, recruiting, or what we have is the GIGOS affiliated sites. And these were, uh, have been assembled by what we had, a, we had a call for participation. And stations could apply to be a member uh, of the network. And we were pretty lenient. We probably would have accepted almost anybody who sent in a, uh, a response to this. And, uh, this is what we have so far, and this shows uh, the, the VLBI stations, the SLR stations, uh, the, uh, the uh, Adara stations. We could have put on the IGS stations, but it would probably would have filled the whole map and you wouldn't see anything else. But certainly the, the, uh, the, IG, the IGS, the IGNS satellites play a critical role in all of this. Because remember, we're going to generate the reference frame but now you need a way to distribute it. Okay, if I'm doing, if I'm doing an experiment in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, okay, I want to be able to connect my measurements into that reference frame. 
and, that's, and that has to be done through the GNSS satellites. Okay, so that's a critical thing to take away. And uh, this, is, of course, is what's happening down here in, uh, in Latin America. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, there are four SLR stations here at the, at the moment. The, the Arequipa station is, of course, uh, running. We have the Brasilia station here that's put in by the, the uh, Russians that is starting to produce data. Uh, one big problem there is we do not have a multi-constellation GNSS receiver there. So that uh, really devalues, uh, devalues the data. Uh, we have the La Plata station, which I understand is, is <coughs> imminent. We're going to uh, going to see data from that in this next year, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, and we also have the San Juan station, uh, which has been uh, equipment uh, and installation being provided by folks in China, and that I understand. I've got some good news today that some of the equipment needed to update that and repair it has arrived. So we should expect something there. I mean, 2020 is going to be a bonanza year. You wait. <laughs> uh, oh, this is uh, an example. Richard have already, has already shown this. These are the kind of uh, certificates that we give uh, stations that are in the uh, okay that are uh, in the uh, 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 GIGOS network. Uh, these were a projection of core sites. Um, and they, uh, they include uh, not only uh, sites that, are, that currently exist, but also sites that are projected, sites that are, which the discussions are underway. We've put, this is the discussions are underway, and I, I, I don't know how much confidence to, to put in that. I think they were all possibilities, and, and hopefully they will materialize. Um, this is the form in which we uh, provide the, the network projection, uh, what a station is going to be doing five years and ten years from now. So we have here we have the, the stations, and then we've projected what they, what they have now, what they'll have in five years, what they'll have in ten years. Okay, so if you're doing analysis or, or simulations, you might want to uh, take a look at that. Uh, this is a copy of the uh, requirements document that we put together for folks who are building stations, planning to build stations, or thinking about it. And it's not, it's not simple. You have some of these techniques interact with each other. Okay, some of, them, some of the radio frequency broadcast from one, one uh, technique, like a, a radar from the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, from the SLR station, okay, could be interference with, it, with the VLBI station. So you need to consider that and just point out that you need to consider that in the design of, of stations. So the reality is that uh, many sites uh, will not be at, at ideal locations, which is what I said earlier. Some new technology stations are being deployed and unfortunately not being co-located. We have an example in, in Japan. We've got a, a VLBI station that's being built and an SLR station that's being built there I don't know, 50 kilometers apart. And uh, he said, why don't you put them together? Uh, but there are political issues. So, um, so uh, the core site will develop, but it's going to develop over many years. And uh, so we're going to have a, a mix of, of uh, uh, technologies for quite a while. As a result, as I said before, uh, the uh, co-location sites are going to play a very significant role in this for many, many years to come. And uh, also there are a number of groups who are taking the initiative to uh, improve equipment, build new equipment, build new stations. So I'm, I'm very optimistic that we will reach our goal. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, in our group, the, there is uh, some people that uh, are 
con, concluding the, the collocation measure in AGO in Argentina. Uh, it would be better for us if you or, or, or what you say uh, can um, see what, uh, what we do, what we uh, produce in order to we can state more sure that it's it's in a good uh, I understand, understand. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Now I assume that the was the survey done jointly with uh, BKG and the, the, the local agency here. Yes. I assume. Yes. Okay. Uh, BKG certainly knows how to do the ground survey work. Um, I mean, they have many years of experience and have been, uh, I think, praised for the work, the work that they do. Uh, on the other hand, if um, everyone is agreeable and you want someone to take a look at the results, we could, we could certainly, certainly do that. Okay. Is that what you're asking? Are you asking me? Are you, are you asking me to go there and take I, a look? I, <laughs> no, no. I'm, I'm I think <laughs> I think that in in your um, in your presentation you say that it's very important the collocations. So we are doing the collocation for our first time. We haven't got experience. We stay together, astronomy, surveyors, and geophysics. But it's the first time that I stayed with all, with all, with three techniques. So we we don't know if all is so uh, good. Understand. Okay, but but B, but BKG was involved. Yes. Yes. So, yes. Okay. So okay. Yes. Yeah. Now l let me say w one one thing in that regard. The most important thing is finding the reference point on the equipment okay I and mean, you can measure okay but if you don't know where the reference point is or if the reference point is stable see if the reference point isn't stable then your re then it's going to be moving around as your equipment moves around so all that has to be taken into consideration when you do this uh, do the survey, but let me assure you that the BKG people are experts in this. But if you want me to go, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, all right, thank you again. Okay. Okay, now please welcome to Daniela Tyler. She's from the, from the uh, Federal Agency for Cartography and Geodesy in Germany. And also she's the director of the Central Bureau of uh, the International Earth Rotation and Reference System Service. Let me do Thank that presentation. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you, Victor. <laughs> Hello to everybody. Um, I would like to introduce to you the IERS, the International Earth Rotation and Reference System Service, and I would also like to acknowledge uh, the co-authors of this, uh, this presentation, uh, Wolfgang Dick, who is working uh, in my group and supports the IERS Central Bureau, Brian Lusum from uh, USNO, who is the uh, chair of the IRS at the moment, and Robert Heinkelmann from GFC Potsdam, who is the IRS analysis coordinator. So starting with a bit of history of the IERS, originally the name was International Earth Rotation Service. It was created in 1987. Um, by two parent institutions, organizations, let's say. So the IRS is responsible to the International Astronomical Union and to the International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics, where IAG also belongs to. Um, effective operation uh, of the IRS uh, began on 1st of January 1988. 
And in fact, it, uh, the IRS replaced two earlier services, the International Polar Motion Service and the Earth Rotation Section of the Bureau International de l'Eur. Um, in 2003, the IRS changed its name, but not the acronym. Uh, it's now International Earth Rotation and Reference Systems Service. Uh, in order to better represent the responsibilities. So in order to recognize also that uh, Earth orientation uh, relies directly on a good, well accurate uh, reference uh, system. So, and this was then added in the name. Um, yeah, and IRS funct functions also as an IAT uh, scientific service. So what uh, does the IRS uh, provide? Uh, the IRS provides the um, products of the geometric, uh, or the geometric products of geodesy, let's say. So it provides the reference systems and frames. First, the terrestrial reference system and frame. It provides the celestial reference system and frame and the Earth orientation parameters linking uh, both uh, together. Additionally, uh, so-called global geophysical fluids data are provided uh, that has an effect on, uh, on Earth rotation and reference frames and causes some changes, variations, and in order to study and understand these variations, this kind of data uh, are needed. And uh, finally, uh, to generate all these products, you need convention standards, models, formats, um, uh, unified, uh, so that also what Detlef mentioned, everybody knows which uh, or how the products are generated and a unique way how the products are provided uh, to the users. Um, an overview on the structure of the IERS. Um, we have at a, a top level, let's say, the, the managing administration uh, bodies, a uh, directing board, an analysis coordinator, and the central bureau. Then we have for all of the products that the IERS is responsible for, uh, so-called product centers. Um, for one special product, the terrestrial reference system, we have three combination centers. For specific issues to be studied, uh, we have uh, working groups. And additionally, we have so-called technique centers, uh, which are in fact also IHG services, and I will come to this uh, later on. Um, a short view on the global distribution, who is representing all these components. Um, you see that most of the components are in Europe or in, uh, in the US, so not a real global uh, distribution, unfortunately. And yeah, everybody is welcome, of course, <laughs> um, if you could provide uh, uh, some uh, contribution there. Um, yeah, I mentioned uh, uh, the relation with the uh, IHG Technic services for the geometric techniques. So you know that we have uh, four geometric uh, space techniques, GNSS, VLBI, SLR, and uh, DORIS. All of these four are organized in an IHG service, the IGS, the uh, um, IVS, the ILRS, and the IDS. And these four services are also incorporated to th into the IERS as so-called technique uh, centers, because all products are based on a combination of these uh, four techniques and products provided by these uh, four uh, services. Yeah, the um, management or decision-taking uh, body is the so-called directing board, which is actually chaired by Brian Lusom. Um, and all of the components I showed you in an earlier slide uh, are represented 
within the directing board by a voting member. So you have all the product centers, you have the analysis coordinator, the central bureau, you have the four technique centers, which means the ser uh, services. And additionally, the unions where um, uh, IERS is responsible uh, to uh, are also represented in the directing board and the uh, IHG representative uh, now uh, with the new uh, structure will uh, change in, in December. Um, altogether, we have 19 voting members at the moment. Yeah, starting uh, with the uh, uh, individual centers, uh, uh, product centers that the IRS have. So for earth orientation parameters, we have uh, actually two uh, product centers. One is called the Earth Orientation Center, operated by Observatoire de Paris. Uh, uh, this center is responsible for monitoring the long-term series of earth orientation parameters, uh, generate uh, so-called final EUP series named uh, CO4, uh, it's responsible also for publication of time disseminations and uh, announcing uh, leap seconds um, if uh, needed. Uh, the second product center for EOPs is called Rapid Service and Prediction. It's operated by uh, USNO and as you guess already from the name, uh, uh, there the rapid uh, EOP series are generated called Buetin A and also predictions for EOPs uh, are provided. Since February 2017, all of these EOP products by both centers are aligned to ITRF 2014 uh, reference frame and all EOP series are a multi-technique uh, combination. Another product is the Celestial Reference System and its realization, the International Celestial Reference Frame. Uh, the product center for this uh, is operated by two institutions together, Observatoire de Paris and uh, USNO. Uh, recently, uh, we had a new realization of the Celestial Reference System. It's now called ICRF3. It was adapted uh, last year by the IAU General Assembly in Vienna and became effective on January 1st uh, this year, 2019. IHE recently also adapted uh, this uh, uh, new celestial reference frame and it was prepared together with a working group on ICRF3 with located within the IAU uh, Division A. And uh, yeah, ICRF3 includes three uh, bandwidths, XK and uh, KA band um, sources. For the terrestrial reference system and reference frame, we have more or less two types of components within the IERS. We have an ITRS product center, which is located at IGN France. Um, this uh, ITRS product center uh, is uh, responsible to publish the long-term terrestrial reference frame. The latest realization is ITRF 2014, I already mentioned, and it was published in January 2016. Um, the call for participation for the next realization is already out, and uh, it will be called, the next realization will be called ITRF 2020. And the idea is that this uh, new realization will be available early 2021. That's the plan, we will see. <laughs> so all the services um, are still in uh, uh, preparation uh, for uh, yeah, generating the contribution to, uh, to the new realization. Um, to generate the... Uh, terrestrial reference frame, uh, we have three ITRS combination centers, uh, one located at DGFI at Technical University of Munich. Uh, for the last reference frame, they generated the so-called DTRF 2014. 
uh, EGN France generated so-called ITRF 2014 and JPL generated JTRF 2014 and comparisons between the three uh, contributions or the three solutions uh, were done. Yeah, you see here um, a picture of ITRF 2014 uh, sites included there. All ITRS realizations are multi-technique combinations. Altogether, um, ITRF 2014 uh, contains almost 1,500 stage, uh, stations at 975 sites. That means in red you see the, mostly the, the GNSS network, but additionally uh, VLBI stations, SLR stations, and also Doris. Uh, stations. Um, the, along with the ITRF computation, also earth orientation parameters uh, were estimated in order to ensure consistency there. And for the uh, latest realization, the parameterization of the reference frame were coordinates, linear velocities, and nonlinear station motions where the three combination centers um, handled it in different ways, but they were included. Uh, we also have a product center for global geophysical fluids data. Uh, this is coordinated by the University of Strasbourg. Um, for all the three components of the Earth, let's say, where there, are, there is a special bureau, so one for the atmosphere, one for the ocean, one for hydrology, and additionally there's one special bureau uh, for mass changing within these fluids in a combined, uh, handling this in a combined uh, system. And the product center is responsible for providing and evaluating uh, these uh, products. And finally, very important product center uh, for conventions. Um, as I said, for all the um, for all the products you, you generate, you need to clearly define which models, which constants, which standards uh, should be used in, in order to be uh, consistent and so that the products are usable. Um, so the product center for convention, conventions is also operated in cooperation by two institutions, it's USNO and Observatoire de Paris. Um, the Currently valid version is still the IRS 2010 conventions, but for some parts there were already uh, updates uh, which are always provided on the website. But uh, we heard already earlier that uh, also there a call for participation to renew uh, or generate a new set of IRS conventions uh, was issued already in February 2018 and an editorial board was set up and this editorial board is uh, organizing the new release of the IRS conventions. Yeah, we have the IRS analysis coordinator um, uh, who is elected for four years with one renewal possible since December 2018. That's Robert Heinkelmann from GFC Potsdam and the analysis coordinator is responsible to ensure the internal consistency and also the long-term consistency uh, between all the IERS products. And uh, the analysis coordinator is also responsible for uh, an appropriate combination of all the single technique uh, contributions into the official IRS multi-technique products because, as I said, all the IRS products are combined uh, products, no single technique products. And uh, one important issue we heard about this is the consistency between celestial reference frame, terrestrial reference frame, and earth orientation parameters. And uh, in order to achieve this or do more steps forward into this, uh, direction. Actually a uh, uh, working group is in preparation and it's a joint working group because it will be under IERS, under IAG Subcommission 1.4 and uh, IAU Commission A2. 
Uh, finally, the IRS Central Bureau, which is uh, operated by uh, BKG. Um, it is re responsible for general management of the IERS and it is the executive arm of the uh, directing board. And so the most uh, important thing that you as a user for IERS product might know is the IERS website. You see here a screenshot from the um, uh, starting uh, page under this uh, address. Uh, behind uh, there is a data and information system for all the products uh, uh, of the uh, IERS and if you go through the website, so for instance you have here one part data products and tools, so we provide also tools for visualizing and accessing uh, the different IERS products, reference frame, earth orientation parameters and geophysical fluid uh, models. And another important thing is publications. Uh, the IRS uh, issues several types of publications. For instance, we have IRS messages, uh, which are um, sent out via email uh, with important information about products, uh, changes in the products, uh, information about important workshops, etc. There are so-called IRS bulletins, uh, which are sent out also uh, via email uh, for uh, related to Earth orientation data and also the leap second announcements. And we have two other type of publications, which are online and printed versions available. Uh, one uh, are the annual reports. That's self-explaining, uh, I would say, where every component uh, provides a short um, description what uh, was done uh, within the respective year. And uh, related to the products of the IERS, we issue so-called IERS technical notes. And uh, one technical note that you might know published uh, recently or a few years ago is Technical Note 38 on the analysis and results of ITRF 2014. That means one of the main products of the IERS and also the IERS conventions are published as uh, IERS technical notes. Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs> We still have a minute, couple of minutes for any question or comment for Daniela. I think no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Daniela. Well, um, our last presentation is uh, the International GSS Service. Um, Uh, welcome again to uh, Alison Craddock. Uh, we remember she's from JPL of NASA and director of the Central Bureau of the International GNSS Service. Okay, hi again. So your presentation. So it's, uh, it's always difficult to be the last presentation before the lunch break, but I will try to keep it entertaining and brief. <laughs> so um, as many people have uh, alluded to earlier, uh, the International GNSS Service is a, a, a service of the IAG. Uh, we are also very proud to now have a bilingual central bureau. and so. Uh, you'll notice that there are some translations in my slides. They're provided by my, uh, my vice director. And so if, for whatever reason, you wish to con contact the IGS and you're, you feel more comfortable doing it in Spanish, we can fully support that and we will do whatever we can to try to, to help you out. Um, obviously, sometimes uh, you, only, you can only go so far, so we'd have to switch to uh, English or another language, but um, we're making an effort. And we all also have this... Um, this nice new brochure. 
which I only have English copies with me, but we will be producing a Spanish edition very soon. So if you would like to have a Spanish uh, version in, in paper format mailed to you, uh, please let me know. We'd be more than happy to send you some so you can distribute them within your institutions. Uh, I also bought plenty of these, so if you'd like to bring a couple of these home with you, please take them. And so I am presenting this on, on behalf of the, the chair of our uh, governing board, Gary Johnston of Geoscience Australia, or formerly of Geoscience Australia. Um, and uh, I would like to acknowledge my, uh, the help of my uh, vice director in content and translation. So what is the IGS? It is the it provides on an openly available basis the highest quality GNSS data, products, services in support of the terrestrial reference frame, earth observation and research, position navigation and timing, and other applications that benefit the scientific community and society. And that's quite a long sentence, but what we're doing is we're trying to make sure that GNSS is constantly improved, made available, and uh, Look, looking for new ways and new applications of making sure that it is as relevant as possible in the broader Earth observation community. So, what are our what are our objectives in in, in this work? Firstly, the, the service wishes to serve as the premier source of the highest quality GNSS related standards and conventions, data, and products, and ma to make this openly available to all user communities. We try to always emphasize the value of data sharing, not just data, but also skills sharing. And that the more, the more we sh are able to share these things, the even greater return that we will get. So we want to attract leading edge expertise to pursue challenging, innovative projects in a collegial, collaborative, and creative culture. So we want to make sure that we are talking to people who are interested in applications of GNSS or improving uh, the, these technologies so we can learn more about how we can further support these, these innovations. And we try to do it always with a, uh, with a, friendly, a friendly face. And we incorporate and integrate new developments, systems, technologies, applications, and changing user needs into IGS products and services. And so we try to have a, fo a future looking perspective. Furthermore, we strive to facilitate the integration of IGS into the International Association of Geodesy, GIGOS, and more other more broadly based earth observing geodetic and global navigation systems and services. We also recently uh, have formalized uh, cross-representation with the International Federation of Surveyors in, in recognition of the fact that you know, we do have an element of our community who are increasingly uh, using GNSS technologies for land survey and cadaster, and we wanted to make sure that, that we were facilitating good communication across our organizations. We mean an international federation with committed contributions from its members and with effective leadership, management, and governance. We try to always engage with our, our members and try to m organize our work in the most efficient way possible. And we try to promote the value and benefits of IGS to society, the broader scientific community, and in particular to policymakers and funding entities. So always trying to reiterate the value of making these contributions in a collective and, and organized way and to make the value of making them openly available. Now, as uh, many of my colleagues have already uh, touched on, uh, IGS is one of four uh, Space Geodesy International Services and Techniques. Uh, we've already gone over what they are. And we emphasize that uh, this data is used in a terrestrial reference frame determination and access. We want to make sure that GNSS is a uh, readily available way to access the greater international terrestrial reference frame. 
And so, and we also look at GNSS sites included in regular position and velocity time series. So our products. So IGS collects, archives, and distributes GNSS observational data sets of high quality to satisfy the objectives of a wide range of scientific and other high-end applications and experimentation. These data sets are used by, uh, by the IGS to generate the following data products. And so w we, uh, we aspire to make a wide variety of products that are making the best use of what resources we have and also making sure that we talk with each other to learn about new ways of combining or examining these things for it even uh, ever evolving applications. So this includes the, the satellite ephemerides and related information, earth rotation parameters that we contribute, coordinates and veloc velocities of our tracking stations, the satellite and tracking station clock information and time scale products, as well as atmospheric information, both in the ionosphere and troposphere. And I'll, um, I was asked to give a, li a little bit more detail about our atmospheric work, which I will at the end of the presentation. So there's a number of components within the IGS, which includes our extensive network of tracking stations, data centers, a data center coordinator, analysis and associate analysis centers, an analysis center coordinator, and working groups and pilot projects. We also have coordinators for products or components, such as the reference frame, network, real-time, timing, etc. We have a central bureau, just like our colleagues at the IERS. Uh, we also have a governing board and committees, and uh, of course our associate membership. And uh, I would encourage you, if you're at all interested in becoming an associate member of the IGS, we are we very much so welcome participation from our colleagues on this continent. And uh, there's lots more information about uh, how to access our website and how to potentially apply uh, for associate membership uh, on this brochure. So our ground station network, which uh, Virginia mentioned, has uh, numerous, uh, I think 59, IGS stations in Latin America. You can, uh, you can visit our website here. We are in the process of refreshing our website, so uh, if you check back in about two months, it will be even better than what you see right now. So here's an example of our current map of the uh, stations in South America. And really at the core of a lot of our work is our working groups appropriately named. Uh, we were working for the continuous development of new applications and products with these, with these components. And we also hold, hold open associate member and working group meetings uh, in years that uh, do not include an IGS workshop. And so just as a, an overview, these are our, our current working groups. Now I mentioned open associate member meeting. Uh, so we, uh, we have uh, IGS community workshops every two years, and in the years in between, we try to also uh, create a, s a time when some of our uh, associate members and friends can get together, talk about progress on, on the recommendations that they may have made at a particular workshop, and what the path forward is. We also want to make sure that there's a, a time and a place where uh, people who are interested in the IGS or, or better, in better connecting with the geodesy community can do so in a kind of a free and open manner. And so we try to do this the Sunday morning before uh, AGU, the American Geophysical Union meeting. Uh, this year it's uh, 8th of December in San Francisco. And so we will be uh, sending out a, a reminder about this meeting to the greater IGS uh, mailing list very soon. But if you are going to be in San Francisco for this meeting, we uh, welcome you to come in. Uh, you can participate or, or just observe, however you like, but it's a time for our, our governing board and our working group chairs to 
be able to engage with people who are maybe not, not yet involved in our work. And also we will be having a, an IGS workshop next August. It's going to take place in Boulder, Colorado. And the theme will be science from Earth to space. And we're looking at uh, taking a look at how GNSS technologies are really spanning from the ground that we walk on all the way up into the heavens. We also try to maintain some social media presence. Uh, usually Twitter is the most uh, commonly populated version, but we do have a Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram as well. So we encourage you to uh, like us, follow us, and, uh, and let us know if there's anything that we can try to support from our end. If, you're, if your institution is making an announcement about uh, a new project or initiative or something that you're doing uh, relative to GNSS, we're m more than happy to uh, make a mention of that on our social media to support it. And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, we do have uh, interfaces with the United Nations. And so IGS, uh, through uh, the IAG, participates in the, the UNGGIM, which we, we already discussed. Uh, but IGS also participates uh, in collaboration with the IAG as co-chairs uh, on the, a working group in the United Nations International Committee on GNSS. And so uh, along with IAG, IGS is an associate member of the ICG, International Committee on GNSS. Uh, we're co-chairs, as I said, on the working group on reference frames, timing and applications, not only with IAG, but also with our colleagues at the International Federation of Surveyors. And just a little background about the ICG. Uh, it is open to state, states members of the United Nations, international organizations, or international entities that are responsible for GNSS and their augmentations operating under governmental authority or involved in implementing or promoting GNSS services and applications. And so it's a forum where the people who are the actual providers of GNSS technologies come together and talk about how, it's a forum for them to come and actually figure out how to work together. Things like interoperability and, uh, and other applications, recommendations for how the technologies will be uh, sustained and improved are discussed there. And so just to touch a little bit more about uh, our atmospheric uh, studies, we're looking at how tropospheric and ionospheric analysis can really uh, protect life and property. I mean, you know, we keep circling around to the theme of disasters and that seems to be something that is more and more in the news for unfortunately um, bad reasons. You know, people are being impacted by disasters more and more. And how can we look at how our work is, has the potential to contribute to uh, reducing our risk of disasters and, uh, and really protecting our livelihoods. And so we're hoping to have improved observation capabilities to understand processes related to water and ice distribution in the atmosphere, uh, document climatology and meteorologically of the atmosphere through developing of monitoring networks, supporting studies of emerging issues, helping agencies and policymakers develop strategies based on atmospheric information, ensuring access to access atmospheric information. And it gets back around to how can we share these resources with the people who need them most? And how, how can, by our sharing this, we receive an even greater benefit? Um, yeah, so we have this in, too much words to fit on one slide, but it's also available here for the help, that helps. But I think this, this gets around to, we want to make sure that we're always talking with our community, trying to learn more about how we can try to support key issues. Not only are we trying to sustain the progress that we've made in the last 25 years, but how can we make sure that we are really um, being able to address 
press, pressing issues that can really help, help our society, help our science, and, and help each other. So, um, yeah. It's really about global engagement. We, nobody can really do this by themselves. Not, not even the, no, big countries need little countries. We need people on all parts of the planet to, to feel free to ask questions, to feel free to say, I have something that I can share. It doesn't have to be anything big. Even, even small things, when shared in a, in a collective environment, can contribute to greater progress and success. And yeah, and just to reiterate, the climate and weather challenges require interdisciplinary action. And we want to, uh, <laughs> when we look at, at issues of, of climate and, and a lot of these other applications, it's, it's something where we, it really helps if we have the ability to talk to each other across disciplines and across, across specialties that we, sometimes it becomes so easy to concentrate on a particular application that we need to, take a moment, take a step back, and try to find out who else we can talk to who might be using our data, who needs our data. People that we don't even think about uh, in terms of people we uh, talk with on a regular basis. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Everybody take a brochure, please. <laughs> Thank you, uh, thank you, Alison. Uh, thank you, Alison, for your presentation. Uh, I have a quick question: uh, Is IGS planning to generate uh, combined official multi-giant GNSS orbits and clocks? That is our hope, and we're working toward it. It's uh, it's still it's still in progress, but I I really hope that that happens sometime soon. Uh, there are a lot of people who are working very hard to try to get that in, a, in an official capacity very soon. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, no? Okay, well, thank you very much, Alison. And uh, we finished for, for the, the, the morning the session, so we can go to lunch. Uh, no, no, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Um, uh, please don't go to lunch yet. We are going to take the picture, the event picture, outside of the hall. So just hold on for your uh, anger a little bit more, okay? And uh, the second announcement is that uh, some people are asking me about transportation for dinner tomorrow, and there will be no transportation. This is uh, why we, uh, we selected the, the restaurant, which is just across the... General Osorio subway station. For people from the hotels that are coming every morning in the minivans, uh, there, there will be the same minivan to go to take you back to the hotels, okay? And the supper and the dinner will be held at 7.30 p.m., okay? Então, amanhã não teremos transporte para o restaurante do jantar, da cena, uh, mas o restaurante é ao lado da estação do metrô General Osório, em Ipanema. Tá? Apenas as vans que estão trazendo os partic alguns participantes dos hotéis de Copacabana e Ipanema para cá, levarão esses mesmos participantes de volta para o hotel. Infelizmente, não há lugar para todos. Tá? É isso. É, o IBGE é, disponibilizou uma mesa onde vocês... É, é, retiraram o crachá no primeiro dia, com algumas publicações disponíveis para consulta e até para a sessão para aqueles que tiverem interesse. Ok? IBG also uh, uh, has a table where you got your badges in, at the first day, where you can uh, see and, uh, and read and also take away with you some publications from the IBG. Ok? Thank you.